OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Oh yeah, we're dancing into Tuesday like we're a troop of Brazilians celebrating the fourth goal. Is it controversial? I don't, I don't know. Apparently it is. No, it's not. Yeah, we're here to police the tone of everybody just like Keys and Grey. Mostly Keys, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. What, policing fun? Yeah. Richard Keys can't be celebrating that. Policing fun. Can't be celebrating the first round win in the FA Cup when you're like, no, league. can't be doing that. You just have to try to win the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine Saudi Arabia never celebrated the win against Argentina. They would have regretted yeah. that. It's true. You know, they got a public holiday. That was nice. They had their moment. But then a half time, you know, you're, last night I was watching ITV and Brazil have absolutely annihilated South Korea. It's an absolutely incredible, especially 40 minutes of football uh, after good. the first goal. And then, you know, Roy's problem is... Uh, the celebrations. Yeah. The he, I mean, I think, the whole, I think the whole point was that he was, I thought he was being funny. Like He was very funny. Well, that's his the thing. His comedy line, the strictly line was great. So, But his overall point. His overall point doesn't make any sense that like they were celebrating the happier they got. They were still celebrating with Ford. I was like, yeah, well, now they're like, <laughs> now they can rest, yeah. rest everybody. I thought that was, that didn't make any sense. Uh, Didi Hamann has had no humour about it. Ah, he, <laughs> he was like, no, there's an unwritten rule you never take a goalkeeper off. It's like, okay. <laughs> like, you know. Just giving every member They're of the They're not going to be dancing time. in two weeks. No. I mean, that, sorry, that was a good line, but he didn't actually deliver it. <laughs> Peter Collins reminded, I think, if I'm, maybe I'm, Peter Collins said it? No, Peter Collins said, you said they weren't oh. going to be. Because Didi obviously was like, he said this good line, get inside the line again. I was like, okay, you're not going to do it. All right. not to do it for you. <laughs> I, I think the Brazilians are outrageous. How dare they have fun? I mean, why would they have fun at the World Cup? Happens every four years. Like, celebrating a goal? Are you serious? Celebrating qualifying for the next round of the World Cup? I mean, get a grip. Grow up, Brazil. What's happening right now in the production box is Emma Carroll has come in to Jojo, who was from Brazil, and be like, get in there and defend Brazil because he was very happy to see that celebration. And Jojo's right. Jojo comes in as a ray of sunshine every morning and he's like, you should celebrate life. And that's exactly what they did four times last yeah. night. And the be- one of the best moments of the World Cup was the manager getting involved in the celebrations. Yeah, Tiche and was then Tiche comes out after and says, look, by the way, we weren't disrespecting anyone. We were just really, really happy to score those goals because those goals were unbelievable. Mm. They were each of their own contenders. There's all the a, the it's all a little weird, isn't it? It's, it's all like, it's kind of a weird sports culture. Um, uh, Colin Fenley's in the papers today talking about the speech that, the, that the, was made when the cup was being collected last year by the Bally Gunner captain who said, oh, we robbed it from you today, lads. And Bally Hale are like, yeah, you did rob it from us. But like, how does the speech have any impact on literally one of the greatest ends to a hurling match that we've ever seen? Yeah. Where an underdog beats the greatest... The line before it was, by the way, you'll always go down as the greatest team of all time, but we robbed it from you today. And apparently that's the same level of disrespect. I'm like, that's the opposite of disrespect. That's like, <clears throat> we did everything we could and we still got away with larceny. I think the, the point is a lot of these Brazilian players grew up in favelas and dancing and samba culture is literally their culture. Dancing is part of their, their like, it's not like us Irish where like I'm sitting here like this here this morning. We do have to be I've careful of the stereotype here though, you know? No, like, of course, you know? but I've, I've got, we've got the Catholic guilt, repressed repressed energy that we can't yeah, yeah, yeah. dance over. Okay. That's generational trauma. You want me back there, Shane? Go on, keep going. We've got generational trauma that means we can't express ourselves like Brazilian people. And yet, you know, river dance came along and sexified the whole thing. Of course, yeah. Freed us from the strictures of keeping our arms down by our sides and then also gave birth to that clown. I'm sure, what can you do? Yeah, but Riverdance was a break in proceedings from the actual event, which sums it all up. It was accidental joy. I'd love to see it. That was great. Now, back to the thing. Yeah. Whereas, I'd love to see Brazil would have dancing. incorporated as part of their actual, you know, that's the show. Yeah. But yeah, it, you do make a good point. Because what I wanted to know is Roy Keane was saying, uh, after the first goal, which is true, right? If you're doing that after the first goal, that that could be considered disrespectful in his mind. Mm. And the fourth goal would be fine. But also, like, what does he want them to do? Is it the old school shaking hands? Let's go back to the centre circle. Game's not over. It's nil all, lads. It's nil all. Which is not, what, which is not all. what his Man United nil did. All. No. It's not, it's not what they did. They celebrated wildly after every and goal. He, they ran the length of the pitch. He's been on camera saying you should celebrate goals. You should do it. And yeah. his mind, it was too much. Anyway, I, I thought it was very joyous. Um, but the goals themselves. Brilliant. That Thiago Silva reverse pass. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took uh, took commentary a while to actually identify who the assist was from mm. 38 year old centre half Silva I mean that's how joyous this Brazilian team is when their oldest defensive player is that good on the ball 
and uh, also Richardson it was like an astro goal where he took a touch and could have literally done anything with it and the yeah. South Korea goalkeeper it was like this is going to go in no matter what I do oh, the and they just had that momentum yeah. I know you're a big fan of momentum <laughs> they just had that momentum on their side that like no matter what they did this is going in and Piquetta too who had seen a bit of West Ham on the overly impressed with him he's oh, decent but like that finish with the caressed volley ah. it's just beautiful the one thing is the one thing I would say about Brazil they haven't really faced anybody yet and against Croatia I think they'll beat them fairly comfortably it's not a great Croatian side or certainly not as good as they were four years ago when they mm. reached the World Cup final so Brazil's first real test could come as late as the semi-final it will yeah and they don't want to repeat what happened in 2014 <laughs> <laughs> well they're definitely not going to lose seven no no, no against, but, against Argentina or Holland or no that's the but I mean they could have they had any sort of adversity so far not really other than Neymar's injury uh, but they, their strength of death is phenomenal like they're it is like it's such a good squad and beforehand you know John Duggan was big on saying Brazil he thinks they're going to win and I was like I'm not really sure but Brazil I'm not sure but geez on paper they're, they're frightening Brazil England final now John is saying which is a scary prospect no, it's think. also very ex- that's an exciting prospect there's sitting and watching there is like no chance England are getting to the final no no, not, no chance really uh, no chance if they win if There's they no win way. if they win on, at the weekend they won't win at the weekend but that, oh. okay so fair enough but the, all they got to do is beat France and it's going to be fairly straightforward I think after that that's it's not they <sighs> no, have two more matches uh, but no one as good as France chill doesn't matter Spain, sorry. they're still going to be good like at this point what's happening is you were saying yesterday these last 16 are actually quite good because everyone that we want to win is winning meaning the quarter final is going to be unbelievable eight really good sides France are great if they beat France they're still going to have to play a good team well, I really don't think it could be Morocco it could be Portugal yeah, Morocco are good yeah but not not. you would say no chance of, of England beating them you'd say every chance of England beating Portugal I said no chance Spain. of England winning the whole thing yeah, well, and I think the, the well, stop against them. France I think the stop against France you have Kylian Mbappe against uh, not quite match fit Kyle Walker it's going to be carnage Oh, madness. That, that, that's the battle we all want to see. Did you hear the quotes from Matty Cash, Poland right back, Aston Villa's own? Yeah. About, yeah. Go on, tip Sounds absolutely Go terrifying. On. So, Matty Cash said he studied him in bed that day. Before the match, he was looking at loads of Mbappe videos. This is how I'm going to combat the greatness of Mbappe. Had it all set up. Then the match started and he was like, oh my God, I'm immediately in a conundrum. Do I go tight or do I let him have space? Problem with tight he spins you immediately. The problem with space is he has this amazing ability in Mbappe where he'll get the ball, he'll run with it, then he'll stop dead. So then you have to stop dead and then he accelerates, he goes from 0 to 60 in 0.5 seconds. Yeah. Which means that there's absolutely no catching. Like, Cash said his legs were burning afterwards. Now, you take that, like a match fit, Matty Cash, very good player, not as good as Kyle Walker, mm. but Kyle Walker is a match fit. So they're at about the same level. Mm. If Mbappe wants to, and he will want to, if he's on form, if he's 100% fit, surely there's only one result. It's going to happen on Saturday. Yeah. No? Am seven, I wrong? 7 p.m. kickoff as well. This is going to be juicy. Everyone. Uh, is, a lot of people. Watching. A lot of people think he's not going to pick the same team. That he's going to go to three at the back and have Kyle Walker as a centre back and have Trippier mark him. So you've actually got a double marking happening on Mbappe. Mm. If that happens, I can see it being nil all. Um, maybe, maybe they take that. I don't know. We need a. There has to be an England penalty shootout, or else it's not a major tournament. Yeah. I mean, it, it either happens. Saturday, or it happens in the quarter fi- in the uh, quarterfinals. There won't be there won't be penalty shootouts this tournament for England. No, because they'll be out. Right, very quickly. Here's what's coming up between now and uh, ten o'clock for you this morning. Uh, Keen Tracy is going to join us in the studio because big bombshells from Wales and England both pulling the trigger on their respective head coaches. Uh, England not fully confirmed, but all the papers have it that Borthwick is in. Kevin Caban is going to join us in Qatar. Uh, we've got sports pages. Uh, we've got Paul Bellew, the Galway chairman. Maeve de Burka, who played football for the Republic of Ireland, is going to talk to us about that thing we were talking about yesterday about uh, PE and school uniforms and just keeping people participating in sport for longer. And then some Philippe Auclair demolishing the character of uh, Arsene Wenger uh, around about half past nine for you this morning. Uh, other big news overnight. The big news overnight, the Wayne Rooney news. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, I was wondering where you're going with that. Yeah, I was, it's very, very entertaining. Wayne Rooney gave an interview to uh, Everton Fan TV. It was really, really a uh, good interview, but it's absolutely unbelievable how insanely honest Wayne Rooney is about everything to do with football, where he just finished up a matter of years ago. And he cuts this kind of intimidating looking figure now with the cap as always on. There he is on screen for people yeah, who can yeah. see. He has the cap on, the full beard. He's built out a bit now since he's stopped playing but you know it still looks kind of fit in his own right like but 
you wouldn't mess with him. There's kind of a real kind of uh, intimidatory factor looking at Rooney now. And uh, the words match the look because he was pulling no punches and there's a great clip doing the rounds which uh, I think we have now to play. It's about 30 seconds of yeah, Rooney talking about playing, playing with Everton. I want to be there. Yeah. The next minute, you're the best. It, it, it's mad how quick it changed. Did they? Yeah. yeah. So, it, like for me to go in with with, with Duncan, obviously Stubbsy, um, obviously every, all of them who I've, I've grew up watching and yeah. Mark yeah. Pembridge, yeah. them kind of, you know. <laughs> but to, go, to, to then go and play with them, um, train with them every day and, mm. and play with them, and then so quickly, I remember thinking, these are crap. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Did you hear that? So what, what happens next? After that? Yeah. <laughs> he's just like, um, so Rooney is definitely on the verge of naming those players, but the interview decides to go another way. But he's like, no, like really, I couldn't believe the standard of some of them. He was like, there were certain players there who should not have been at that club. He wasn't referring to Ferguson and Stubbsy, the fella. He's, he no, I don't think he was there. Well, they're his best buddies. But Duncan Ferguson was a great centre forward, and yeah, Stubbs is yeah. a very good centre half. who played with Celtic as well, and <laughs> did very well for himself. I don't think he was talking about those two. But then I was thinking of players in my head who played that time, like um, Scott Emil, Archie's son was like a grafter, but I wonder was it him or probably not, he was a good player, but it's like, geez, they weren't like, there wasn't a bad, outright, terrible squad, but Rooney, lad, like he had names on the tip of his tongue, all he wanted was an invitation to start naming names, and the interviewer to his credit, because obviously he wants to maintain relations, and he just doesn't want to go that way anyway, that wasn't his style, this interview was kind of, it, it was a very kind of a positive overall interview, he went a different avenue, so Rooney moved on with the conversation alongside him, but he was ready to name names like but it was uh, that clip itself was remarkable because for 29 of the 31 seconds you're thinking oh yeah this is very nice a tribute to when he started off because Rooney there is talking about when he was 17 years old 16 mm. well I know at the point when he became 17 when he spent a few months into in the squad so what he said happened was he broke into the team Everton fan this is a dream come true scored that famous goal against Arsenal, had scored against Wrexham in the cup before that they were actually his first two goals for the yeah. club which he's at in the state in the interview and then he said very very quickly I established myself as the best player in the team and people in the team around the club became intimidated by me because I was very outspoken uh, and I was clearly the most technically gifted in the side and he's only 17 years old that's him at 17 years old <laughs> talking but it's like geez, look these players are no good so he went from hoping that he would get on the bench to playing a minute for Everton to basically knocking David Moyes' door saying why aren't we signing better players we need to sign better players we need to improve. And he also references um, Franny Jeffers controversy moved to Arsenal from Everton yeah. when he had his glory spell and one of uh, Rooney's very early goals lifted up his jersey to reveal once a blue, always a blue, which he says in the interview was a criticism of Jeffers for leaving and then the interviewer said, but then a few years you did the same thing and he was like, yeah, I know, so I totally understood why Jeffers did that. Yeah, fair. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, like he talks, I suppose the best way to summarise for people who haven't seen it and it's available on YouTube um, to see on the Everton fan channel is like he's talking as if he finished playing 20 years ago mm. not just you know the other day essentially where he would very much know all of these players still and he has an air of um, I have an air of guy who's so comfortable with himself and where he is in life that I'm just going to be as honest as possible he wasn't nasty in any way but he was just like this is actually what happened Imagine that confident 17 walking into a squad first team Premier League squad and going I'm actually better than It was fairly obvious player. though right? Yeah of course like it was obvious that he was physically as strong as any of them and he was also better than clearly better than them like so can you imagine what he was doing in the training yeah and, but it wasn't just the everything I mean he was clearly better than most players in the league he, like, he, it was a freak of nature really I, and they referenced there's a, an amazing goal he scores against Spurs in the FA Youth Cup of White Hart Lane where he hits free kick hits the wall it comes back chest volley and puts it into the top corner yeah, 35 yeah. yards out and he was only he was, he was like a teenager like, and it was unbelievable what he was doing but like um, you know he was saying like Look, it, uh, it was great to play, but we needed to be so much better, so much quicker than we actually were. Mm. And that's when he moved on. Like, um, And he just talks, he's such a normal guy and he's he basically still the fan within him and he became a world-class player so quickly. He knows, a tr I suppose when he goes into first team training, he knows he's going to be pretty good because I think I remember reading one of his books, he was playing under 16s at the age of eight. And if you're playing under 16s when you're eight, you're like, well, I'm... And he was scoring goals, by the way, at eight years old in under 16 matches. So that's, yeah. that kind of highlights the, the level at which he was at. And... I mean, he is an, he was an intimidating. Like he looks, he now looks like a bouncer on Camden Street. He's got that look where you're like, this is pretty intimidating. He's got the hat and he's got the he's wide. I would say small town, uh, provincial disco, not even Camden Street. Yeah, it looks like a barman. Or no, a doorman in Mullingar. 
I just say the uncle of a great footballer. Yeah, he's, he does. And and he's he's still a young man, like. But you know, he was talking when he only realized he was very good at fourteen. He just thought he was a handy player. Then realized, geez, I could actually make it professionally here. Mm. Um, and then you know, very quickly it you know emerged like I'm. He's just gonna he's just gonna go so far. But he talks about that Arsenal game, the goal as well. After that, he just went home and continued to play football with his buddies and just hung around the park. And he said like it was just so normal to me. And then like in his England debut. They I think they lost to Australia 3-1 mm. uh, at Upton Park and after that he went home and played football with his buddies and he was wearing an all France Adidas tracksuit and he was just like this is the clothes I had at the time and he said like very quickly all those things started changing do you remember he got BBC Sports Personality of the Year when he was 16 and he was like he was saying in the interview he was like that was so weird like why did they give that to me <laughs> and he said he, ne- he didn't own a suit at the time so he had to buy a suit and Colleen had to buy a dress and he said they had absolutely no money like he wasn't getting paid mm. so they had to borrow money to buy the suits and dress and then David Moyes wouldn't allow Colleen to stay over in the hotel because she was underage that's how young he was yeah, so yeah. the time there was controversy the next day that he was disrespectful because the shirt was so tight around his neck that he unbuttoned it and he just went up and said thanks very much and the tie was down he walked away and he was chewing gum and he was like I wasn't being disrespectful that's, just what, I, I was just, that's what I did and I thought it was mad the outrage of it and he said he was never comfortable with any of that commercial stuff anything at all public facing he just didn't want to do and I think with increasing time like as it passes and you read his articles in the Sunday Times he's so tactically nuanced and he's a fascinating insight into the game and he, I've become more and more intrigued by Rooney the person Yeah he's a very interesting character I think he's going to be a really good TV pundit I think he mm. might end up being one of those <clears throat> not a brilliant manager but um, certainly so far he's been okay nearly pulled off an, an incredible feat with Derby He's very good at Derby Yeah um, I think it'd be great to see him on TV every week, though. Appointment viewing. He's like Roy Keane. You'll, you'll, chew, you'll tune in. When There's definitely an element to that, you know? Yeah. But like, there is, yeah. A career in media would be better for him as well, with less pressure and, you know. But I think that's a good point because I think if you were to say that to, to Rooney, like, you know, there's less pressure here and you can do this and you can enjoy it and you're really good at media, I don't think that would motivate him. I think he wants to prove a point that he can actually be a really good manager. And the fact that he's gone out there and tried, you know, I, I, I have a lot of time for him. And when... You know, I don't know about you, Shane, but like uh, when he was at Manchester United, I'd often get frustrated with him because he could be his performances could be so extreme. Like when he had a bad game, he had an awful knack of his first touch to go out the window, and he'd just mm. be almost the worst player on the pitch. And then you remember when he, he tried to leave and all that in 2010, and he was like, I wasn't happy with yeah. where the team was going. And you, there was times you're like, I'm not so sure about Rooney, but you only really realize in hindsight how brilliant he was. In and, hindsight, and you all prefer Rooney to Ronaldo. Hindsight, yeah. No, Absolutely. I never said that. But should I, you be a man now. You're, I don't know oh, yeah, uh, no, where you're going right now, though. After the latest outburst from I Fernando Santos, I, I actually can't talk about him. Like uh, Fernando Santos, it, it, the common denominator now we're, we're understanding and realizing is Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, welcome to our lives from 15 years ago, lads. Yeah. Like welcome, What's welcome, welcome, welcome. What's it mean? Now you've all the scales have fallen from your eyes about Cristiano. I think there's two versions of Ronaldo that, like the, the 03 to 09 Cristiano Ronaldo, yeah. was a very different type of. He was a bit more humble. Cocky still, but a bit more humble in his... He uh, just wasn't as exposed to uh, public-facing social media platforms and uh, Pierce Morgan at that time. He yeah, just well. mostly played football. But I would love to go back to the analysts of the news talks, um, audio and listen to you talk about Cristiano Ronaldo from 03 to 09, because I would imagine he would be appreciative of the guy's genius. Uh, no? Roll the clip. I mean, look, obviously he's a very good player, but like his character never seemed anything other than... like So... The incredible work ethic, which separated yeah. him from Wayne Rooney, say, is something that should always be remembered, right? They're the same age, right? Mm. So, like, if Rooney had looked after himself the same way, he could still be doing something at some level in the game, on the field, and have this amazing managerial career still to come with, like, multiple more medals and way more records and maybe a major tournament with England. I don't know. Like They always get compared, those two, for obvious reasons. Same age, side by side in the same pitch, but it's unfair to compare anyone mm. to Ronaldo in terms, of dedic- in terms of dedication to the game. There is, no, there is nobody we're like not Ronaldo. Choose, freak you of nature. choose to be dedicated. You choose to work you ch- hard. You choose you to be choose dedicated. To, uh, to, you choose your diet. You choose the, the okay. level of activity and commitment you have. That's not, that's not something that is in him like with, with no work. He worked at that. That's that's Paul O'Connell's. Let's be world class at the stuff that doesn't take talent. Yeah, Paul O'Connell, and you choose to be dedicated. Like Roy Keane chose to be dedicated because his fear was, I don't want to go back to Ireland as a failure. But Roy Keane was still able to enjoy himself off the pitch. Ronaldo is like nothing. Like he is so incredibly dedicated to the brand of Cristiano Ronaldo that separates him from everybody else. Patrice Edward talks about going over to Ronaldo's house 
back in the day when they were United teammates and he said I'm never going back there it's so boring even though I love Ronaldo himself we went to his house and we sat down and we ate skinless chicken and unflavoured broccoli and then we just sat down and talked about football and was like oh I need an escape from this guy because he's so intense in his preparation oh. whereas the vast majority of other footballers are incredibly dedicated to the craft train very hard have so very few vices, but they never, ha- never have the extremes. Ronaldo was on his own planet. That's why I always think it's unfair to compare Rooney and Ronaldo. Having said that, Rooney could definitely have helped himself more. Like he even talks about well, on, a- on his Everton full debut the morning of, he went to McDonald's for breakfast and then later on he had beans on toast and he was like, look, that's just what I did. You know, that was my background. So Rooney was the street footballer come good and probably, and he would say himself, wasn't an example to follow and he peaked ridiculously soon in his career. By the time in his late 20s, he massively slowed down. He would say that himself, but he was still dedicated enough to actually do something with his career. Think of the amount of players who didn't. Yeah, but like you would say that they were at least similarly talented. And so one has had this incredible outcome and one has had the outcome that, that happens when you just different bodies. dedicate yourself. I, I would go as far as saying uh, Rooney was more naturally gifted than Ronaldo and Ronaldo actually really, really yeah. worked on improving himself. Point. So, uh, really annoying me this morning talking about him even. Go on, there's other so stuff annoying you, Shane. Yeah, a lot of things yeah. annoying me, Jared. Uh, so uh, there were three things in particular that were annoying me about the World Cup that I was sitting there last night just fucking seething. Stuttering penalty run-ups. Stop it. I know it worked for Lewandowski eventually the other night but I mean, take your penalty, run up and hit it. I mean, you're you're putting yourself off by all by doing all this stuttering and messing around. Um, Neymar's worked as well, didn't it? It can work. There's there's no doubt it can work. But I'd love to see the percentages as to how often it works compared to someone just running up properly and smacking the ball into a corner. As the lads were saying last night in the show, hit the penalty, practice it. Don't practice a stutter because then you become known as the player who stutters. And like Jorginho does it, and every so often he doesn't do it, which throws a little curve ball in. But goalkeepers can prepare for that. One of the other things that was annoying me was the yellow card for. For taking your jersey off, I feel like that's a long rule, though. That's been there for a long uh, time. Yes, but <sighs> get over yourself. Like Abubakar is yellow. I uh, obviously he had to get the yellow card from the referee. The referee was very apologetic, tapped yeah. him on the back and stuff. Um, but I was reading the, the FIFA laws. I was like, this is how uh, bored I was last night. FIFA law twelve Medication. says it's permissible to demonstrate joy, but that joy must not be excessive. So this is why why the jersey rule is there. Now it kind of comes into the Brazil stuff as well, and we're saying the Brazilian players should be allowed to celebrate. They should be allowed to take your jersey. Like, wh- wh- who are you harming by taking your jersey off? You should be given a yellow card for celebrating if you run into the crowd or you incite. It's indecent, fans. Shane. It's, it's indecent. Indecent. indecent exposure. And also, at the oh, time yeah. uh, when the rule came in about twenty years ago, there was a lot of political messages on uh, underneath jerseys. So the Ro- Rooney one was more football, but there, I remember. Um, Thierry Henry displayed it as a West Indies pro West Indies uh, top after. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something like that. Was it for he's friends of Brian Lam or something? Anyway. Um, I remember, and it was the Premier League numbering on its vest as well. So I think they wanted to outlaw any political messages. Because uh, if you lift this shirt up at all, you get uh, penalised for it. Yeah. Your penalty one, though, I disagree with. I disagree with Mick as well in the news round last night. Just right. get up and smash it. No, like... Don't, this, no, this no, goes, sma- goes, pl- smash it and hit it hard into a corner. No, I get that. I, I understand the finishing part, but he was like, just go up and hit it. It's like, no, because it's instantly forgettable then. And this goes back to the Brazil celebrations. It's like, the whole point of sport in the first place is escapism. So it's like... The whole point of a penalty is to score it. Not to be remembered. No, no, but it's, it's not, not to be remembered. No, like this is the problem. This is the language of a lot of ex uh, professionals. Is like of a certain era. It's like go out there and do your job and win. It's like, but no, you're one of the very, 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 very lucky few in the dance. history of mankind to actually play football for a living. It was like enjoy it, mm. please enjoy it, so that we can all enjoy it with you. But if you go down with this attitude, it's like. You know, you have to prepare, like, because you, you you can't give the ball away and, and don't lose it in the last 10 minutes and put the ball in the corner. It's like, oh, these games are instantly forgettable as yeah. a result. Like, it's I fair. have no problem with the shuffle run up. It, it adds entertainment. The last thing that was annoying me, we could probably play the B roll with the volume down on this one because I don't want to hear it anymore. It's Box Park Wembley. So, £25 for a ticket. Um, now, Box Park website says, please refrain from throwing things in the air, especially things made out of plastic, your shoes, or your hopes and dreams. They hurt. That's hey. on their website. But uh, so I, I actually took some notes on this last night when I was watching. It I was like, "Looks like purgatory on earth." What, what is it, Shane? What is Box Park? Box Park is a place where England fans go to watch the matches. There's one in is it Cro- Croydon? Yeah, Croydon I, as I well. That one, it's very nice. So that, that was Box Park Wembley, where the, the you Minus pay in to, to watch the matches. I can understand going to watch a, a, it's just a, a venue, general, is it? Just a venue, essentially, where you, you pay in, you watch the match in a c- controlled environment, uh, as controlled as that looks, where pints are bought just to be held on to to impulsively then throw into the air when a goal is scored. So you buy your pint to drink, and then you buy your pint to to wait just for the cameras and then back it in the air when, when the goal is scored. Right. I actually think if, if, if aliens landed on planet Earth and happened to land at Box Park Wembley during an England match, they would 
immediately depart, go back to their home planet and say, no, there's, there's no sign of intelligent life on that planet, so oh. there's, there's nothing there. Um, so, sorry, sorry, hang on a second now. If Roy King criticising... No, 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 different. No, 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 different. no, just let me, let me finish. If, if Roy King criticising Brazil for dancing is stomping on their culture and borderline racist, you giving out about English fans throwing beer in the air and no. being kind of loud and obnoxious, that's their culture, Shane. You've got to let them be who they are. It's not their culture. It's not their culture. I mean, this is... This is where... Drinking it, shitty warm pints in a Weatherspoons. that's their culture. It's where the Canary Wharf business suits meet the Brexit here colonialists for their for their beers and their throwing. It's the it's the forced celebration. The Brazilian stuff is natural to them. When someone tells yeah. you who they are, Shane, you gotta believe them. To to defend my client there, um possibly the reason uh, Shane has outlined this problem is when you're throwing your beer nonchalantly up in the air in wild celebration, you could be affecting another human being negatively. Could. Whereas the Brazil celebrations is all good nature. They're not hurting anybody else. To me to me is box park that could be a difference that See, we, we, what we just watched there makes George Orwell's 1984 look like Teletubby's world. <laughs> I would prefer to be in George Orwell's novels. Can't, you can't switch it off. No, you can't. But that's dystopian. That was a dystopian. Like that video, that's why I didn't yeah. want to listen to it anymore. It's dystopian. It's um, Now you're Alexa listens to you on purpose. <laughs> it does. It's purgatory. Right. 7.56 this morning. OTB Hair. I'm brought to you live each morning with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish your day. Up next, Key and Tracy is going to join us in the studio to talk about the Eddie Jones news and Warren Gatlin first. The last in the news round, obviously talking about the fad of unusual penalty run-ups at the World Cup. And Japan missed the first penalty, missed the second penalty, and it became pretty inevitable after that. The penalties were poor as well. Yeah. Did you like Lewandowski's penalty? Uh, yes. I didn't the first time, but I liked the fact he backed himself to do the same thing the second time. It's funny, Rory, it made it cool. Rory O'Connor was in earlier, and he was saying it wasn't for him. He thought it was just had a bit too much going on. Just yeah. take the penalty, kind of. Yeah, yeah, but then the fact he did it and it came off the second time was cool. But yeah. it's such a fad at the moment that we're seeing so many like yeah. really crappy penalties being missed. I'm sorry, but do what the first guy for Croatia did and just come down and just whack it whack into it. the corner. Mm. Yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know. I just Can professional footballers who are this good not trust themselves to kick the ball hard and into the corner? Instead yeah, of, I take like, the point. I, it must be harder to do the, the, the dance the as keeper. you're trying to kick, waiting for the keeper to go. And a lot of them aren't good enough to do it. I definitely think... If you're in a, it's a standard Premier League game and you're a Jorginho and you're good at it and you're not overly nervous. I kind of think I, I understand the logic of well, if you wait for the keeper to go, then you're guaranteed to score yeah, by but why running did the it keepers in. Go? But well, it's hard not to, you know. It must Jorginho be hard not to. who does the same thing every time. Why? Although, every, one in ten times he'll just hit it normally, and then you're like, ah, oh, I was waiting for him to go. But I think if you're under a lot of pressure, it's a harder yeah. skill to execute. A World Cup final, I would think. Listen. Definitely. Got to be feeling The fluid, whole world is relaxed. on your face as we wait for VAR, as we wait for complaining, as the whole thing takes about five, ten minutes yeah. in a shootout. The first, the Japanese, the first penalty taker, number 10 for Japan, was up there for three minutes before he got the, pe got the kick the penalty with the yeah. referee arson around. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. He knew he was going to miss straight away. Like. There's too much going on in it, perhaps, if you're super nervous. But... Um yeah, I guess it's it's a uh, fan at the moment for sure. Uh, Keen Tracy, the Irish Independent, is with us. Talk to us about the uh, ongoing situation in rugby in England and in Wales. Keen, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are um, you? I, did Wales want to get their stuff out first? Did they want to get their claws? And Warren Gatlin wasn't really a runner for England, was he? Looks like the Sea Borthwick thing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, even making. even the Ronan O'Gara stuff, I think, was all a bit of shadow boxing. Ronan O'Gara probably didn't do too badly out of it when you think that he's getting a, a nice new contract in La Rochelle now as well. But yeah, I think the succession planning. Obviously, England weren't. We're hoping that it didn't come now. It was after the World Cup. I think Bortwick has long been identified as the man. So probably no great surprise if it happens today or tomorrow when Eddie gets the chop. Why are they not giving the job to Scott Robertson? What is wrong with these people? Yeah, I, I still think Scott Robertson. If if truth be told, is waiting for the All Blacks job. Um, now that could be complicated by the fact that Joe Schmidt has come into the the All Black setup because when he was doing so well with Ireland, he was being touted as you know a possible next man. And New Zealand and the All Blacks generally want their their coaches to be involved in the system, and that was one of the flies in the ointment for Joe Schmidt because he was over here. So since he went back and obviously working with the Blues, and now he's obviously very much involved with the the All Blacks. So he's a potential future candidate as well. But I did notice in Warren Gatlin's press conference yesterday, he gave a ringing endorsement of. Um, of Scott Robertson as well. So I think Gatlin probably knew that he wasn't going to get that all-black shot either. 
even since he went back to the Chiefs it hasn't been going that great for him so um, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a merry-go-round really isn't it? it it's a bit like I imagine what covering football is like in, in the Premier League when managers are getting sacked because you just don't really see it in rugby that often at all so maybe it's a bit of a sea change for, for the game as a whole you know I guess Borthwick has been involved with England as well before before the 2019 World Cup as forwards coach so like, what does he bring to it? Yeah, it's interesting. Like his first coaching gig was with Japan under Eddie Jones, so he's very much an an Eddie Jones, um, an Eddie Jones man. Um, so yeah, like Leicester won the league, the Premier, the Premiership last season under him, and there was no doubt they played well. But I was covering the Champions Cup quarter final when Leinster went over to Welford Road and did an absolute number on them, and I thought like it was just very uninspiring. Um, they don't play attractive rugby whatsoever I mean you, you know what you're going to get with a Steve Bortwick team so what do England and the England supporters want I mean they got booed off against South Africa and the attacking the attacking game plan has been really poor under Eddie Jones for the last couple of years and that seems to be what's been you know the, the straw that broke the camel's back so I was looking I was kind of re- refreshing my memory like the Leicester Tigers attack coach is Richard Wigglesworth who's a player player coach so is Borthwick going to bring all of his Leicester Tigers backroom staff in? Is there someone else going to come in? Because the attack seems to be what you're crying out for. There's no doubt he'll bring stability to the set piece. He's a really good forwards coach, but it's a calculated risk all the same, even from his point of view, because I think he would have probably known that after the World Cup, it's probably my gig if I wanted. But now coming in, what's to say the Six Nations won't go well, the World Cup won't go well, and then all of a sudden he's got this contract possibly until the next World Cup, but England fans are already doubting him. So I think it's a, it's a strange situation, but England have probably backed themselves into the corner now. Were you surprised that they did make the decision to get rid of Eddie Jones? Like This is all part of Eddie Jones' uh, general... Uh, schedule be really bad before a World Cup but be good at the World Cup I was yeah I, I was a bit but I suppose when you go back and look at it you you have to see some evidence of what they're actually doing and I just don't think we have like he's he's really nailed his colours to the Marcus Smith Owen Farrell axis and that hasn't really worked at all and that's going to be interesting as well because you look at Marcus Smith and how well he's played for Harlequins and he hasn't been able to translate that kind of form to the international stage at all. And if you go back to Bortwick, they left Leicester left George Ford go at the end of last season and they got in Andre Pollard who hasn't play, really played yet because he's got um, an injury. But Andre Pollard isn't the type of out half either who's going to you know set your game alight. So what does that mean for someone like Marcus Smith, the golden boy of, of English rugby? You know, they're still kind of holding out hope that Tuilagi, you know, is the player he was several, several years ago. And even when he's fit, he's looked a shadow of uh, the player he is. So Eddie Jones has kind of pinned his hopes on a couple of players and then everyone else around him seems to have constantly been coming in and out of team because in the middle of it all, I think they've lost their identity. I think you'd be, you'd be struggling to pick England's best 15 I think at the moment because they've just have been no consistency in selection at all so um, from that point of view maybe I'm not surprised but yeah you're right Jared. Like if Eddie Jones does one thing and one thing well it is get teams right for the World Cup we saw it in 2019 obviously they came unstuck in the final but you think back to that semi-final performance and sensational it was incredible it was one yeah. of the great great performances um, definitely of recent years so um, yeah like I, I, I'm surprised in, in a certain way but also when you hear fans who were ultimately the ones paying the very expensive tickets going to Twickenham booing at the end of a game which again is like you don't see that at rugby no. too often as well um, Eddie Jones coming out saying he doesn't care what people think like ultimately like these people who were paying and the tickets in Twickenham are bloody expensive they're keeping paying his wages in a job so ticket sales apparently been slow for next year's Six Nations as well which right. I imagine comes into when the bean counters are sitting down with yeah. the, in the review this all has to come into it as well So If you're Borthwick though you're looking at the World Cup draw and you're thinking oh my God, that's a pretty good draw, especially the way that all the teams are playing at the moment. So Australia could absolutely knife you on any Mm. day. That's possible. Wales now with a new uh, head coach, it's possible. Uh, Japan are on the same side of the draw and Argentina are on the same side of the draw. That's including pool stages, uh, quarters, semis and uh, then you're through to a final. Like it's right there for them. So I can see why the temptation is like, well, all I got to do is pick 25 who I think are going to be my main 25, work the hell out of them, decide on a style of play, be very, very, very conservative and, um, you know, swing low, sweet chariot. Yeah, but like very conservative, is that going to please like the, the England supporters because this is what, like what do they want? Do they well, want winning I, rugby or do they want to see... Well, that, I, so, right, I, I, I think what they'll do is they'll have a little bit of patience for English 
player struck, not quite legend, like, you know, Borthwick, good player, not great, right? Um, was Am I right in thinking, was, did Borthwick win the World Cup? Was he part of that? Was, was he probably uh, just after me? Uh, uh, certainly he was a first teamer after yeah. that, where they weren't very good for a long period of time. And so, soldiered through a long period, you know, very well respected, still very young. I think he gets a little bit of wiggle room in a way that Eddie Jones' wiggle room rolled out, like, after the last World Cup. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, if, like I said, if the Six Nations doesn't go well, we've already seen England fans are booing their team off the field. Like, English rugby is in a strange place at the moment. And I think part of the, the reason why the supporters aren't happy is when you look at this style of play, actually, ironically enough, Leicester, a side who won the Premiership last season, um, they've definitely moved to a more expansive game plan. Even Saris this season, who were top of the table, have really reinvented the wheel. Not reinvented the wheel, but in terms of their identity and what they're about. So... Week in, week out, supporters are seeing teams like Harlequins throwing the ball around and playing great rugby, but it, it, that doesn't always fully translate to test rugby, but there's just been so little evidence of that at all. And Marcus Smith, like I said, is the is the perfect example of that. And yeah, it's going to be pragmatic under Steve Borthwick. I think he's he's he'd be very well respected by the players as well coming in, but he doesn't have a lot of time to shape like his, his identity and his team. The Six Nations, the year of a World Cup, you're kind of thinking you're fine tuning things rather than kind of you know ripping up the script and starting again. I rarely, I wouldn't put too much stock in the three or four warm up games that they're going to have because they're always kind of really shadow boxing. You don't want to get injured. Players don't want to get injured and stuff. So he really doesn't have a lot of time to to turn it around. And like we said, Eddie, that's what Eddie Jones does well. He gets teams ready for the World Cup. So uh, it's going to be interesting. I just think it's it's going to be fascinating that if Borthwick comes in, who is going to be in his backroom team? Like I said, Richard Wigglesworth is a player coach at Leicester. One guy who's very interesting is Alad Walters, who was uh, with Munster when Rassi Rasmus came in and did an unbelievable job. Went to the Springboks, helped them win the World Cup. He's the head of athletic performance. Uh, Leicester snapped him up. He helped them win the Premiership. So he's a guy who come, could come into England and I think make a big difference as well. He was on uh, Bothwick was a member of England's wider <clears throat> 03 World Cup squad, but then narrowly missed selection to the to the final 30, apparently. Um, like... Uh, are you, would you not rather be taking over an England team on the tough side of the World Cup draw? Like, no, less expectation. <laughs> no, you get you get beaten. Yeah. Well, f- yeah, but there's, there's there's another they argument. Could, to they it. could play really badly and reach a World Cup final, and and the side that they play in a World Cup final could easily have been absolutely decimated by injuries. Yeah, yeah. And, and the same can be said for Wales as well. Like this yeah. exact conversation that we're having, but I think. I think the Wales situation I'm sure we'll get onto is a little bit different I just think that Eddie Jones' track record it's it's just been such a turnaround from Bill Sweeney and the RFU who were backing him to the hilt mm. constantly and he still has the best winning percentage record of, of any English coach and um, okay November 73%. was 73% yeah yeah, yeah. Um, just ahead of Clive Woodward I think his good his good buddy which is um, which is interesting they seem to be having a nice little <laughs> tete-a-tete in, in the media over the the last couple of years but um, yeah like you know like I said when when the fans are getting on top of you it's probably it's probably time to make a change but I'm still a little bit surprised and even from Bortwick's point of view he comes in and like I said if it doesn't go well at the first in the in the Six Nations he's under massive pressure going into the World Cup Clive Woodward's latest um, pointed comments towards Eddie Jones were pretty good um, so he pointed out that semi-final win in, in 2019 against the All Blacks but he said he'll be remembered for the misguided rhetoric and unfulfilled promises like do you think history looks back on Eddie Jones's tenure uh, positively in any stretch. Yeah, like not like they, not winning the World Cup in 2019 after delivering, like we said there, one of the great performances. I mean, that was probably a black mark in his name. And then it's just been downhill ever since then because you're kind of thinking, okay, this is what England are capable of on their day, and they just haven't been able to build on that at all. They've been they've been going backwards. But I still think he'll history will be kind him for sure. Um, It'll be interesting. I think he's he's been linked with kind of going into America now. So on an eight-year um, deal, on an eight-year deal, which yes, you can imagine, yeah. there's a lot of zeros at the end of his salary. So like that's a very very different uh, type of gig. So uh, you'd imagine he's going in with the World Cup being over there in mind, and kind of maybe it's more of a director of rugby type role. So uh, yeah, interesting times in the in the rugby landscape. Like meanwhile, we're all here kind of getting ready for the Champions Cup, and across the water, they're supposed to be getting ready for the Champions Cup as well. But coaches are being fired left, right, and centre. So it's just. It's mad times. Yeah, clubs, uh, more clubs look like they might uh, get sucked down the sinkhole. Mm. Uh, what about the Warren Gatlin situation then? This seems less shocking in many ways that like Pivac was on a very sticky wicket for the whole time. It looked like they'd made some recovery in the summer, but he just couldn't keep it going. 
Yeah, uh, that's less surprising. I mean, when you lose to Georgia and Italy at home in the same year, you were really, uh, you were really kind of on thin ice. Especially then, when Warren Gatlin conveniently takes um, a gig, you know, over here and was a prime video he was doing, and you know he's kind of hanging around and going around visiting the Welsh clubs and saying, okay, like I haven't gone away here at all. And like I said, I think a lot of that was down to the fact that he realised when he went back to New Zealand that the All Blacks job just just wasn't going to happen. Chiefs Chiefs thing hasn't gone all that well for him, so. It's funny, like reading the coverage over the last few days and on Twitter and stuff, people seem to have forgotten that kind of at the tail end of Gatlin's era that he got a lot of criticism for the style of play, you know, Warren Ball. And we think back to the Lions, like how dour that was. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's kind of selective memory almost. Um, Warren Gatlin is going to come in. I think the big question is, is he going to move with the times? Because the the game has moved on and we saw that in South Africa on the Lions tour. Even South Africa themselves in in November have shown signs of playing a little bit more, a little bit more wit and stuff. So, um, yeah, like, is he going to change or is he going to come in and expect to play the exact same style of play with a squad who was not as good at all as the squad that he had because like, he was working with a golden generation yeah. when he was having all that success with Wales which often kind of gets papered over a little bit like he doesn't have that calibre of players to, to call upon now so um, there are a couple of good young players like I mean a guy like Lewis Rees Amit has almost fallen off and become the forgotten man because yeah. again Wales just haven't been getting the good the, the best out of him so it's interesting like Pivac did a g- really good job at the Scarlet he's the only kind of Welsh coach to ha- or well, c- coach of the Welsh region to have won a bit of silverware over the last a good while uh, but he came in trying to play that Scarlet style of play and it just didn't work like we were talking there about you know playing all the bells and whistles rugby that doesn't always translate to test rugby and we saw, for sure we saw that with Wales so, and then he tried to revert back and he realised to more towards the Warren Gatlin game and he didn't have the players to do that So, uh, but I've no doubt that Warren Gatlin will definitely galvanise everyone it's just whether he can he, like I said he can kind of fine tune his like Sean Edwards was a big part of his success he's not going to be there who's going to be his attack coach is he going to keep Stephen Jones who really didn't do well you'd have to say under Pivac so he is good at that though, isn't he? He is good at like, getting people to, to yeah. join him and that's the one thing you would say about um, his ability to reinvent. It won't be him doing the reinvention. Mm. He'll get somebody else who knows more about it. Yeah, well he that, he's normally, a, he, he's very much a director of rugby type figure. He, you know, he likes to have a coach on, on the field who, who's doing that kind of stuff for him. But at the same time, like, getting Warren Gatlin in is great and I think like just most of the supporters will be really happy but it doesn't fix all the issues in, in Welsh rugby and that that is the big kind of overarching sense and it was interesting reading the press con- or the press release um, with re- regard to his announcement that it's potentially true to the next World Cup and that he's going to be involved in a root and branch review so this isn't necessarily which I think a lot of people would have assumed that he was coming in for next year that's it a big fat paycheck and he's yeah. riding off into the yeah. sun so if you can get someone like Warren Gatlin in who knows Welsh rugby obviously like the back of his hand and actually fix some of the issues because even throughout his time there he would have butted heads with the Welsh Union quite a lot so if he's coming back under conditions that okay we're going to make changes then it could like it could be an absolutely genius move so um, like Ireland going to Cardiff first up in the Six Nations suddenly becomes a lot more interesting <laughs> doesn't does. it that, those grenades <laughs> the little uh, the little the little needle the lot of needle that um, Warren Gatland has with Ireland is great and it, it actually adds something I think mm. to that we've kind of missed it whereas Wayne, Wayne Pivak was like yeah yeah vanilla well, nice, you know. I mean, particularly if you're losing Eddie Jones, you need yeah. you need uh, Warren Gatlin back in on yeah. things like that. His time at the Chiefs was a complete disaster. Like mm. that, we shouldn't. Uh, so he definitely went home with the notion of I can get the All Blacks gig, and then nothing went right. So when he signed, he he signed a four year deal with uh, the sabbatical to take over the Lions, which uh, immediately is like. Okay, so you're coming. You're going to take charge of our club, and then you're going to leave us for a while to go and do another job on the other side of the world. Mm. Okay, it's okay, yeah, okay. And then they lost every game. And then while he was away on his sabbatical, the team miraculously improved. Mm-hmm. Like, with no significant change in some some players, but no significant change of, like, uh, playing stock, which would definitely make you a little bit concerned if you're a Welsh fan going, I mean, you, you had it and then you lost it. You don't always have it. Exactly, yeah. And he, w- I think he went back and he, again, he tried to play that kind of, you know, one-dimensional style of play. And if there's any country that's not going to go down well, it's in New Zealand, you know. Um, I think it was always a bit of a pipe dream that he was going to get the, the All Blacks job. I think his kind of media dealings would really put, I, I would imagine, the New Zealand Union off and stuff. While it's great from, from our point of view. Um, 
so yeah, like this is the big, the big kind of question I would say hanging over Warren Gatlin coming back. Is he going to, you know, adapt? Is he going to move with the times? Because there is absolutely still room for the style of play, and it was bloody effective at times. But you need more strings to your bow, I think, in Test rugby these days. We've seen it with Ireland, like the rugby that Ireland are playing, France are playing, like I said, even South Africa throughout the November series. You know, you saw glimpses of them, you know, trying to play with a little bit more width. So um, it's not a foregone conclusion, but certainly. Like you said, Ireland going to, to Cardiff in the opening game of the Six Nations, you're suddenly, that looks a lot more dangerous than it did with kind of Wayne Pivak in charge and continue, continuing this. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, that's what we say. You're, you're delighted for Is he the risk free option? Like, it, it, it almost as a feel of Alex Ferguson returning to Man United at some point after he leaves. Like, yeah. it, so there, there has to be risk associated with it. Never go back to your ex, Shane, isn't that what they say? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, Ronaldo, like, we're talking about Ronaldo this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah th- there is risk, but like, it, I think the big risk is that you come in and you expect Warren Gatlin to just copy and paste what has worked before, which I don't think will work. But I think, yeah, he's a smart appointment. And like I said, if he's going to come in and do the root and branch review as well, then I think it could be a really, really smart appointment. All right, Keen, good stuff. Thanks a million for that. Cheers, lads. You can read more from Keen Tracy on the Irish Independent. It is 15 minutes past eight this morning. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day it's competition time uh, the Leopard Star Christmas Festival takes place from the 26th to the 29th of December a great day out for sports fans socialites and thrill seekers alike every day this week we have two hospitality places for the Leopard Star Pavilion to give away a reserve table lunch chat and tips from top tipsters and much more to enter comment with a horse emoji on our main Twitter page add off the ball and you're automatically in the hat remember to ensure that your DMs are open because that's how we'll tell you you've won the Leopard Star Christmas Festival from the 26th to the 29th of December. Tickets from €35 Euro available at leopardstown.com. After this short break, our man in Qatar, Kevin Kilban. OTB <laughs> This is OTB Sports Radio. Well, that is one of the things I noticed. I was like, <laughs> there wasn't even a sneaky Katie McCabe in there. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports. They're incredible. I mean, I'm just it's not usually in awe of teams that much, but I just can't help being in awe of Barca Femini. Like, they're just incredible. Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. They're looking at some of them players thinking, I want to be there. Yeah, the next minute, you're the best. It, it, <laughs> it's mad how quick it changed. Did they? Yeah. yeah. So, it, like for me to go in with with, with Duncan, obviously Stubbsy, um, obviously every, all of them who I've, I've grew up watching. And, yeah. Mark um, Pembridge, yeah. sometimes, you know. <laughs> but to, go, to, to then go and play with them, um, train with them every day and, mm. and play with them and then so quickly I remember thinking these are crap <laughs> Kev <laughs> who's he talking about Kev hi Jay <laughs> <laughs> name names well he mentioned Duncan, Duncan and Stubbsy didn't he so it must be it must be those guys eh I think he was uh, I think he was naming them safe in the knowledge that it wasn't them they were the only ones he still has some respect for You. when did you get there I came, well, Wayne played, made his debut at the end of that season. So, you know, obviously the famous Arsenal goal, played two or three games or made a couple of appearances. And then I, I signed in the summer just after that. So it's, he's probably only played two or three games and I, when I arrived. All right. So you were one of the new arrivals and he's like, oh man, look at this. Look at what we're getting here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, He went to see the manager knocking on the door saying he wants Champions League quality, you know. There you go. There you go. I delivered that in eighteen months' time after. So after Wayne had gone, so you know the, there was no complaints. Then was it? There you go. I love the way the yeah. interviewer mentions Mark Pembridge and Wayne just oh, has a little shots giggle. Fired. Just a little giggle. You didn't play yeah. with Mark Pembridge, Kev? Did you? Poor Mark Pembridge sitting there going, no, "What am I doing?" No. Well, Mark Pembridge. To be fair to him, he was Wales international. He was a good player. He was, yeah, indeed. But. Around that time as well, obviously we we'd gone in and the club were it was definitely in a in a bit of transition. Wayne obviously went the following summer after that after the Euros. Um, 
but it, it was Wayne was Wayne. I, I think was we saw the frustration in Wayne every single day in training. I don't know if it was frustration or just the way that he played because Wayne would hack everybody down virtually every day, and it was um, it was a period of, of the club when I don't really know. I don't really think they knew at the time where they were going to be going to. The budgets were slashed on Moisey and he was having to try to get players in around, you know, obviously lesser wages than Duncan, Kevin Campbell and players like this was on. So it was a tough period for the club as well. But good characters, great characters in that club. There really was, yeah. When you got there, were you impressed or otherwise with the quality of the squad? Like, did you think similarly to Rooney going, actually, I thought some of these players were better? Or were you like, actually, this isn't bad, we could do something here? Uh, no, I thought they were, I thought very good players, very good players. I mean, you've probably seen the Wayne documentary. You've probably seen the Rooney documentary, the one that they had on Prime. And he says the same sort of thing. He just says it differently. He just said, I knew I was the best player in, in the club within you know, two training sessions or one training session. Uh, so I, I'd heard all that before from him, really. And um, I think that's just his way, the way that he's um, he's trying to describe things. But no, it, Jerry, they were good players. They really, Duncan was a Duncan was very, very good, probably underrated. Like he mentioned Stubbsy there, uh, David Weir, Steve Watson, Tommy Gravison. Tommy Gravison was oh, yeah. top class, went to, went to Real Madrid. So... Uh, no, we had we had really good players. It's just that Wayne was was better than all those good players, you know. Yeah, he was, he was genuinely proper Champions League world class quality. Uh, so how long did he stay? I actually don't know. How many years did you play with him? Uh, I had one full season. Yeah, the one full season with him, and then he was gone after that straight away. So they didn't even like yeah. hang on to him. Nowadays, you'd like to think that they'd be able to hang on to him for three seasons and get to the fringes of Champions League football, use his goals to make some extra money, and um, and maybe keep him. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's what that's what you'd like to think does happen. But he was that good, Jay. That was a thing. Uh, even you know, at sixteen, seventeen, when he was when he was in the side, there he he was honestly that good. And you you were watching him in training every day, and you were seeing the power that he had and how he could. You know, we we had Joseph Yobo, um, uh, Nigerian international, who was probably the the quickest player that I would have played alongside. So strong, so quick. Wayne was not quite as quick, but nearly as quick as him, but so much stronger than him. He could just outpower him. And Joseph Yobo had probably played his whole career where he'd been the strongest player, maybe coming through his youth teams and things like that, the quickest player. And all of a sudden, he's got this kid who can just out out muscle him, who can just you know brush him aside of the ball. And then he's nearly as quick as him. So if, if he gives Wayne an extra yard like he used to do with certain players, he'd always be able to catch up, whereas he wouldn't catch Wayne because Wayne would get away and finish. So, you know, which, which whatever you brought to, to, to whatever you, your skill set was within any squad and probably Man United would have seen it as well to an extent, Wayne was better. Wayne had a different, Wayne had better skill set and better strength, better pace than virtually every player he'd come up against. So that was the difference that, that he had. Did he ever hack you in training, Kev, Rooney? Oh, yeah, once or twice, yeah. Yeah, he did. He was... Yeah, he, he, honestly, he he trained like he used to play, and every single day. Uh, and I mean, I think we've had these uh, conversations when I've been on with you guys before. I used to um, I used to live in between Liverpool and Manchester, so I'd drive over to to Liverpool, and I'd probably get in at maybe eight eight fifteen, eight thirty every morning. And Wayne was invariably always on the training ground. I, I think he got out on the training ground at seven thirty, seven forty five, whatever it was, and he was practicing. He had an, an unbelievable desire. I, I don't think it was a desire to get better. It wasn't. Necess- I don't think he had the mindset of, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working on a technical aspect of my game to become better at a certain thing. You know, like some players, I think a lot of players now have um, have a, you know, a, a real mindset from a young age. I've got to become better at a certain skill set because my right foot's not better. I'm not great at heading. Uh, you know, I've got to work on my first touch or whatever it would be. Wayne just had this this kid in him that just wanted to play football every single day and. You'd see him out, you know, volleying balls. Lads go out to training every day, and you know we have obviously the um, the prehab and um, type of, of um, you'd be doing your prehab before training, make sure that everything's right. You, you're working on your stretching, you're working on anything. Wayne never did that. Wayne wouldn't stretch. He would go out and smash a, a hundred balls into the goal. And everything that every sort of uh, sports scientist, every sort of fitness coach is telling you not to do, Wayne would do it. He just had an unbelievable desire just to play football. That was how he was. That's kind of the anger stuff that he talks about coming out, I think, because it's smashing the ball again and again and again, even though you know at some level this might not be the best thing for you, you're still going to do it. Yeah, I think that's probably it. He, I mean, 
Would you say anger? Would you say a, a, an aggressive side to his game? But he did, Joe. He was. He, he, he honestly, invariably, I, I, maybe not once a day, but once every other day, once twice a week in training, there would be you know an over the top tackle, you know, potentially injuring somebody. Um, you kind of knew it was going to come with Wayne, and that was on virtually every single player on the training ground. He he had that way about him where he just he he, he played every training session or he. The way he trained every single day was as if it was a Champions League final, or if it was, you know, an FA Cup final, or you know, a, a big game that's going to secure you the Premier League title. That was how he, he used to train every single day, and he would go over the top at times. That's how he was, but he's, was, um, that was his DNA. He's he's obviously a man who, at some point along the way, has got therapy because he's talked about having anger issues, and that I think in that documentary and, and various places as well. You, that doesn't that wasn't obvious, or was that like in respect? Ah, okay. When he was trying to crush these uh, grown men in their thirties who were just trying to make a living <laughs> at training and potentially end their careers, maybe that's how that manifested itself. Uh, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think in the documentary, I think he does allude to it, doesn't he, about about um, the way that he trained and things like that. Yeah, the, the anger issues, I suppose. I don't think he, he mentions it specifically like that, but they they were on they were they were somewhere on the line the whole time. Yeah, they they were ready to just to bubble to the surface. I think that's the way that he was. And as you say, I was in my twenties then, yeah, probably mid twenties at that stage, but um, not quite reaching my thirties. But um, there was a lot of guys that. I think maybe it was, I think when he realised he was better and, you know, that there was nowhere for him to go at Everton. You know, if, if, as much as, you know, he got a lot of stick for leaving Everton, he'd just, be, just become top scorer at the Euros. He, it was almost he had to go, you know, that Everton had had a huge offer for him that had come in. Where, where did, did Wayne see his career? He saw himself winning titles and I think it was almost as if that was it. He was done around this group of players because he is so much better than them. You know, I'm stronger than you. I'll, I'll, I'll kick the shit out of you, whatever it would be. And I need to move on somewhere now where they're going to suit my style of play and and uh, and be fitting to my standard of play too. And was it that season you guys qualified for the Champions League? The season he left, or the year after? Yeah, that's, so that's that. that no, next no, season. that year. Right. That year, yeah. We we were in a bit of turmoil that summer when he left. Moy, David Moyes was under a lot of pressure. Um, we replaced Wayne Rooney with Marcus Bent, actually. Um, so like that, like. was, that maybe that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think I think we paid three hundred, four hundred thousand for, for Marcus Bent. I think it was from Ipswich. There was no money in the club, so you know you, you're getting thirty million in for Wayne Rooney, and, you, and you're only and Moise's budget was probably only two million because I think we signed Tim. Tim Cahill came in. We signed him for two million from Millwall. Tim was a great signing, you know, an attacking midfield. You would probably say. Tim ended up being that type of replacement for Wayne because he was the one that was the the midfield link who just used to go in and get goals. Not no nowhere near nowhere near the class of, of of Wayne. Don't get me wrong, but he was the guy that was able to go and get the goals. I, I suppose so. Moise's budget after selling a thirty million pound player was was probably three million something like that. So it shows where the club actually was at that time and. And then the, the club got better and maybe off that Wayne Rooney money over a, a period of time of 10 years, David Moyes went on to have a really successful uh, club there at Everton. Presumably Rooney's top of the pile, Kev, in terms of players you've played with, is he? Um, I mean, I've said it a lot. I Honestly, the only one I think at the age of 17 is, is Robbie, Robbie Keane. There was very little difference, you know, in, in terms of physical physicality Robbie didn't have the physicality but in terms of his ability and the natural ability of just just go out and play he didn't need to go out stretching he didn't need to go out and do do anything like that Robbie I I do and I say it a lot I think Robbie was equally as good not for what he could bring in terms of being able to run by somebody and you know have that devastating effect on a game but Robbie could have a devastating effect on a game in a different way and even on the training ground we we'd see that with Robbie um, there was very little difference at 17 between Robbie and, and Wayne, but Robbie was Irish, so he didn't get the same sort of credit that um, if, if Robbie was English, you'd be talking about Robbie as a player that that was, you know, uh, in, the, in the Bobby Charlton mould. Because if Robbie played in that England side and he got in at 17 and 18, Robbie would have been a player that had 50 international goals. I'd, I'm convinced of that, honestly. And I'd, would would Ray, Wayne Rooney have been able to do what Robbie could do in our side? Probably yes, but but Robbie was very very special. Yeah, very special. 
his longevity as well, the, the dedication to his craft uh, is something that, that Robbie has um, that maybe gets a little bit underrated. Let's talk a little bit about um, the World Cup stuff before, because obviously you're in Qatar for the World Cup. What about Brazil? What What's the truth here about them? Um, uh, Colin or Shane was making the point earlier on, they haven't yet played anybody who's really put it up to them properly. Oh, Is there a possibility that maybe when they come they, up against a good team... Maybe, maybe, but let's be honest now. Could you see? I mean, I watched. We spoke about Croatia before the tournament. You've asked me, and I, I've I've watched Croatia thirty times before the tournament, maybe twenty times, whatever it is. And I said they're they're a good side. You know, I saw them out play France recently prior to the tournament, and a lot of people do get you know fixated with the form going into a tournament, saying oh they beat France and France have lost. France are not in great form, and then France turn up for a tournament and do what they're doing right now. So I don't necessarily think that, but I just know that this Croatian side are a very good side. You know, runners up four years ago. They've 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 produced, haven't they? And they've got tri- they've got amazing football players. And then I watched them yesterday in that Japan game, and I'm like, oh, look, Japan are not a great side. They can't raise the game. So if you're using that analogy of not coming up against great sides, I, I don't I don't have it. You have to you have to do the business. And you know, South Korea had an unbelievable game plan to how they're going to stop them. They played against, they played against Switzerland in this World Cup. They played against Serbia, again, who were another very, very good side. You can't get away from that. And I know Cameroon beat them, but they had 10 changes or whatever it was. So you're not going to really judge them on that uh, Cameroon performance. And South Korea had a game plan. They set up with a way to go and try and beat them. And they, they had, a, you know, tactically, they've, they've done well to get out of the group. They're not a great side, and I, and I know that. But um, last night was was special watching them. It was so, so special to see that the movement on them, the setup on them. And we get away from the fact is that how unbelievably hard working this team are. They, they, they work so hard and the different from many Brazil sides because Brazil in the past would have just got the, the, the great Brazil sides, Jay, that we would have seen in, you know, 86 and 90 and that didn't quite make it. And then the brilliant Brazil sides of all two. In our lifetime, Jay, we, we, we maybe remember 86, we maybe remember 90. Do you remember Brazil really taking apart a side like they did last night against South Korea in that 36 minutes, really taking them apart and going to just blitz them and score the four goals, game over? I don't remember a Brazil side doing that. And every side now, the way that they're set up tactically, are way better than they were in 86 and 90 and, and even all two. And, and they were special teams. Don't get me wrong, they're special sides. So I, I don't take the, that analogy, no, that they've not played a great side yet. I, I, I think sides that have better players will be and physically will be able to deal with the physical side of it. But look how they set up tactically. They, they start in a 4-3-3, Neymar as an eight with, um, with Paqueta, uh, Paqueta as an eight. And then they switch when they have the ball. Alisson gets the ball. They switch the system. So they go to three at the back. Danilo goes into midfield alongside Casemiro. So they make a three. It's it's three, two, um, two, three, I think. I, if if I've got my numbers in my head right, it's, it's unbelievable, the change of system. So, so Rafinha goes high, wide to the right. Vinicius Jr. goes high, wide to the left. Neymar becomes a striker. He goes right through the middle, up alongside Richarlison. And then the movement in midfield is incredible. So tactically, to stop them actually playing out is so hard. And then when they lose the ball, they've got bodies forward that they're able to go and press the ball quickly. But they always have four players back. I talked on it with, with Joe when I was on him last week. So they can't, they're so hard to be counted on. So if you look at a side and they go, yeah, you can get at Brazil. They're sending bodies forward. Watch them. I don't know if you get it, maybe with the RT footage there that, that you're watching, when if the lads are doing a lot of their analysis on the tactical cam, but it's great to do your analysis on how the setup goes. And you can actually see within within that that they cannot be counted on. So Korea are, are all over the place trying to figure out how to, how to stop them when they're in possession, yet they win the ball and they turn and they, they're swarmed upon straight away. So Brazil are winning the ball back quickly and it's... For the back four or the four players that sat in in, uh, in in defensive position, they don't have to do much running so that they, they're conserving energy for if they're able to be countered beyond and, and there's a bit of a there's a bit of a breakaway. So honestly, I mean look at the goal that Korea scored. It had to be a worldie to, to beat Allison, who made two or two or three actually decent saves that were long shots. So I don't know, I, I think this side are the real deal in every way. Honestly, the real deal. They've got the they've got the flamboyant, they've got the creativity, yet they've got the that real bit of solidity to the team as well. 
when you're speaking of uh, of Everton, the Brazilian third choice, Everton came off the bench last night as well, and like yeah. Didi Hamman had his comments on television afterwards, given out about the use of a, a third choice keeper in a, in a match like that is disrespectful, and the dancing was disrespectful as well. I think Roy Keane echoed that. Don't know what your take yeah. on that is. I don't, you have to again. I go back to I, I always remember Brazilian sides as a kid. I remember the dancing after scoring a goal and the having fun. You know, when when are we going? Are we going to always say that? That, that this game is totally... I mean, I, I wouldn't have been able to do what those Brazilian players do. So if I was playing for South Korea, I'd be pissed and I'd be saying, you know, I, I don't, I, I'd, be, I'd be wanting to go and kick them. I was surprised I didn't get a reaction from South Korea that they didn't go around. Maybe that's, you know, in, the, in their nature a little bit, those players that, that, you know, that they don't want to go around disrespecting opposition. But I would have been hacking them down as, as much as I could, probably would have been of the mindset. And as Irish lads as well, we probably would have had a couple of red cards in that game. But... You, you can't take away as a spectacle watching it. We want to enjoy watching football. We want to see players playing with smiles on their faces. Look at the African side in this tournament doing warm-ups and enjoying themselves. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I've always, as I said, I've always watched Brazil sides having this enjoyment. It's a spectacle when they score a goal. They, they appreciate what it means to actually score a goal at a World Cup final and they want to enjoy it. So I don't think bringing a third-choice goalkeeper on is is, is disrespectful because... Everybody wants to play the World Cup, and and Chi Chi, the coach, has recognised that and give them give them a game. And even I, I mean, I, I even saw that Chi Chi getting involved in celebrations was disrespectful. It wasn't. The players are the players are playing for him, and you know he, he looked embarrassed doing it, didn't he? He was embarrassed, but he just wanted to have a bit of crack with the lads, and that's all he was doing. So. Yeah, it was a bit like that, wasn't it? And and the lad will be laughing about that now, and they move on to the next game, and and it's high spirits, ready for. Um, Ready for who they play now as well. I've just forgot now. Yeah, Croatia. Croatia. And let's be honest, I said talking about Croatia, I, I think they're going to destroy Croatia because they don't have the energy in the side. A few aging legs that's in their team. They, they struggled against Japan badly. So I, I'd like to see them continue to enjoy themselves. Why not? I'm convinced it's a generational trauma and Catholic guilt that means Irish players never celebrated in that style. Have we ever tempted to just let loose and throw out a wee dance? Are we sweet? Well, it's because we can't dance. I think probably if you look at us, as we're, we're, we're stiff men, aren't we? we you know, we, we struggle to actually, as you say, we have the dad dance, okay? We celebrated our goals well enough. It might have been the celebration after the game had finished, and I think that's how we like to do it, you know, Shane? Of course. Yeah, yeah. There's no point going furiously dancing. Well, good songs. Yeah, good songs. Good songs. Yeah, oh, yeah, dance, of yeah, course. Um, Kev, you're a fan of Morocco. Uh, tonight's your night. I think so. I am... Um, Spain play well. They'll probably beat them in Spain, but I, I that was my one one pick for that. I think we've, you know, as much I heard um, Adrian saying it the other day, as much as we want a shock or two in a World Cup, when you get to the last day, you want you want these matchups that we've got up to now, don't we? We've got incredible games um, for different reasons. So you know, Europe against South America, the big big nations against each other, we want that. But if there's one shock that I looked at for the last eight, watching Morocco, the power that they have in the team, how organised they are as well, good defensively, very good going forward, good players, uh, Jerry. I th- this is the one thing. I, I think Portugal have too much for um, for Switzerland. Uh, although, I, again, I, I think Switzerland as well, they, they continue to surprise us. They continue to get results. So that wouldn't that, it wouldn't be a huge surprise, but I think Portugal will win. And, but this is the one. I, I think uh, Morocco beat, beat Spain, yes. There's a good chance either or both of these games could go to extra time and penalties. Mm-hmm. It's at that stage of the tournament where, like, I really want to see the Spain team develop and blossom and explode and let the the, let yeah. the kids be the kids. Um, but this is one of those games where those kids are going to be up against grown men who see the opportunity of a lifetime to get Morocco to the quarterfinals against you know Portugal yeah. side. They would fancy themselves, like, or even yeah. like even Switzerland. If Switzerland, good, you know. But then, I mean, it's the it's the it's the quarter final that we want. We'd love to see Spain Portugal in a quarter final and look at the rest of the games. I, I think no matter what anyone says, we want the romance of, of shocks and we want these lesser teams to, to go through. But imagine that Spain Portugal quarter final. That would be just an incredible game, clash of styles a little bit as well. It'd just be such a great watch. But I don't know. We'll see. If if, if all goes to plan, in Spain turn up and Gavi and Pedri produce what they, what they can produce and Morata continues to score the goals and they, 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 they're able to hold off defensively. I'm not too sure about the goalkeepers. Maybe a big issue as well, I think, for them. Um, and I don't, I don't think at the back they're the, the best. I think, as I said before, there's real, real pace in this Moroccan team. So, 
Morocco could hurt them. And if they get a goal, I think they've got a, maybe a formula and a, and a strategy to, to, to defend deep and, and nullify a threat as well. So there's, there's different ways that I've seen from, from Morocco where they can actually play. They can play a real attacking game, but they can also play a real defensive side game. So if they do get a goal, I think Spain will find it difficult to break them down. All right. Okay, great stuff as ever. Thanks a million. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much. Cheers, Shane. Enjoy the games. Cheers. It's uh, Kevin Kilban in Qatar. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, by the way, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream and we're live each morning with Gillette. Now, with thanks to our partners at Gillette, we have a great prize to give away. Head over to our social channels for a chance to win a Gillette Labs heated razor. It's a great prize for you or your family this Christmas. Just nominate your heated moment of the weekend for your chance to win. All right. Good morning, John Duggan. You want to say something? I think uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's going to miss the uh, a crucial penalty in a shootout of this World Cup. That's your prediction. That's my prediction. That's your, that's your heated moment of the weekend. Whether it's whether it's today or whether it's against uh, Spain in the quarterfinal, I'd love to see it. We should make this like your your most wanted heated moment of the weekend. So your most outrageous thing that's going to happen and the best one wins. I think. I mean, I yep. realise I'm supposed to have these ideas before I come on air. <laughs> I'm supposed to communicate them with other people before we actually go live with this. But you know, sometimes the uh, yeah, I'm for it. Sometimes the, the old hamster wheel creaks slowly. Live production meeting, yeah, yeah, I like it. John Duggan. Jaron and Shane, how are we? What's going on? I sure look. Enjoying the World Cup, you know. Um, Finney Pert with a big shout. One of the best World Cups of our lifetime. No, I don't know about that now. Where does it rank for you, John? Uh, well, it's, it's too early to say. We can't make a full appraisal until we see the, the real business and the quarterfinal, semifinal and final. Um, I would say it's probably one of the most open World Cups. Um, but there's definitely a huge amount of issues. Like you, you know, when you're not having stadiums full, mm. it's a big problem. Like to me, uh, and that that is a real negative, uh, from what I can see. Um, I think there's there's loads of things you can talk about this world called like the, the lack of alcohol. Is that cr- creating a better atmosphere? Um, no, no issues. No, not many virals really out of this World Cup. Um, the fact that it is in one place uh, with not that many fans, but it's easier for the fans. Because if you're going to Canada, USA and Mexico, how many games are you really going to see? Well, you're not going to meet any fans from other countries apart from the ones who are at the game. Exactly. Uh, whereas in Moscow, they had two stadiums um, four years ago and you know there's a real congregation of fans. And in other countries where they've had it like Germany and that in the past, you got a better congregation. So um, there is a edifice that's just been built for this thing. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, everybody was saying that the Russia World Cup four years ago was one of the best ever World Cups. Uh, but that now is almost like something you can't talk about because of the genocidal war that the Kremlin have um, launched on Ukraine. So um, there have been some great World Cups. 2006 was great. 1998 was great. Um, 1994 was great. And I, I just think we need to see what happens in the in the coming uh, two weeks to see what happens um, in terms I think of appraisal. We and um, Brazil probably think 94 was great mm. everybody else thinks the quality of football was terrible yeah mm. I, 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 well, it's sometimes a it's very localised viewpoint the final was crap wasn't it it was it was terrible it was in the heat of Los Angeles and it was um, 120 minutes of boredom Diana Ross at the tone uh, mm. but the, I think the board the, that World Cup was up with the novelty the novelty of it being in America the loads of goals and you've like Bulgaria and Romania yeah shots. in fairness in fairness Bulgaria did play really well and that was the Hershaw Stoichkov World Cup yeah uh, Hadji and that and um the heat, like a lot of great story. It was just, it was such a novelty at the time. And once again, I think what a lot of people remember that is the times of the games are great. Eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, um, just really good times, like le- like late late games. And if you're a young person, that that was pretty cool. Um, so last night, uh, well, it was it was brilliant, wasn't it? Uh, so in four years' time, the times are all going to be great, are they? Are there no uh, no assume. West Coast America is going to be a disaster. Oh, sorry, it's West Coast as well. Yeah. Well, that could be that could be eleven p.m. or whatever. Yeah, um, or, for us. or much later. Yeah, or, or later. Yeah. Well, if I'm here, if I'm a, still on this globe, I'll, I'm going to be there because um, I really get the sense that these are the things you want to be at. You want to be in Germany if you can. You want to be in the states. You want to be at these these things. This is where it's, what it's all about. And um, it's just some of the imagery of of the like Japanese and Korean fans crying and um, the, the 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 dancing last night. And um, you really do get the sense that this is the people's um, event. Were disgraceful, weren't they? The Brazilians for dancing, John. Well, I mean, Roy Keane's got a magic in the way he can um, take something and then put it into his own context and dominate the media landscape. That is a real skill. <laughs> it is a real skill. Literally a five-second phrase from it's Roy a, Keane. It's, it's a skill. It's, I, it's a real skill. It is. It is skill. I I actually thought he was taking the pace, to be honest. 
at the start and I, I like when when you see that uh, it was written down it's terrible but like I mean he's got the he's got the sparkle in his eyes did he have one did not have the sparkle in his eyes no, when he no. was saying it he was like this is the worst thing I've ever seen you know that was the the implication I was like is it really no it's not I mean is, um, is, is, what's what's the Brazil coach's job well, I, well the Brazil coach's job is to have unity and he's getting a huge amount of unity by playing every single player in that squad in this World Cup so far yeah and nobody, uh, nobody can complain. I mean, some players will complain. There, 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 Brazil. There is actually something I think quite intimidating uh, for the opposition about that, uh, seeing that that joy and that exuberance and and everybody celebrating. It must not be easy if you're a Croatian player now thinking of what might be coming on Friday afternoon, with that. Um, everybody's in all in on Brazil because I still think the scars are there uh, on the Brazilian psyche and the soul of football in Brazil after the 7-1 to Germany and the only thing that's going to cure that is winning this World Cup that's why Ronaldo's there doing interviews with Richarlison after the game all the big guns are out they're really trying to create this atmosphere of where everything is united and I still think Neymar can, can have even more of an impact in this World Cup um, but to call a winner is, is difficult and Brazil will look pretty silly if they don't win it um, but at the moment, they are looking like the most likely winners. Um, but it is open, and uh, Argentina won't have it all their own way against the Dutch, and I really do feel that England can beat France. As Kev said there, like we haven't seen that from Brazil too often in the World Cups, that 35-minute that period where they just take a game and strangle the opposition. Well, the, transitions, the, goals. the transitions, the speed, the options, and it looks like the balance of the team is good now. But an injury or two, you know Jesus... And, uh, strength and depth is enough is it not to even it probably is enough with Rodrigo with um, Gabriel Martinetti was very good against Cameroon mm. and uh, even Bruno Guimaraes who didn't have the best game against Cameroon you know you've, you've a lot of options and, like, that's why like, Japan out in their feet South Korea out in their feet Croatia I think will be out in their feet on Friday you have to have good squad depth and have those five substitutes as, as impact options that can really make a difference mm. and yes. that's what I think we're going to see and that's why Argentina do they have that um, I'm not so sure You've called the England-Brazil final now haven't you in recent days Yeah it was what the gut was saying uh, much to the chagrin of my Twitter following at John Duggan Sport by the way if you want to follow um, Yeah that's what the, my gut is telling me at the moment um, but I'm hoping that Brazil do it on, on Sunday week Netherlands-Argentina I'm just looking 7pm on Friday as well right during our, our during our work Christmas party which is something to look forward to Hope, hopefully there's a screen on show because that's a game you don't want to miss I mean, that's probably one of the games of the weekend. Well, I never got on Fridays anyway, so. Um, but yeah, it was interesting what Kevin was saying about Morocco, Spain. Um, Alvaro Morata has scored in every game. Morocco have only lost two of their last 42 matches. Um, that'll be a fascinating battle of tactical styles. And then Portugal, Switzerland, I feel is going to go all the way. Um, I don't know how positive Ronaldo's impact is in the Portuguese setup. Well, they're finally starting to turn on him. It's very, it's a very telling moment when the untouchable icon suddenly is getting criticised by the manager. That's, in, that, I thought that was very telling. In public, and we saw with Brazil, uh, sorry, Germany and Belgium, that if the camp isn't fully happy, it, it does have a, a negative impact. The Danes were just completely listless at this World Cup, and I don't know if Portugal are going to be able to maximise their potential until Ronaldo's gone. We haven't hardly seen Rafael Lau, for example. He's one of, like, one of the stars of Syria, and... Um, I just don't know. I just think the Swiss are dogged, they're defensive, they're Jack Charlton-esque and they've got a bloody good record now. And I just think they're going to frustrate Portugal. So penalties? Think. It could be, yeah. That, that to me is like Switzerland winning on penalties. Do you know when you see Ronaldo gesticulating and coaching from behind Fernando Santos's back across the years? Like He seems to have done it quite often. He, when he substituted, he becomes a coach. That gives me the ick. Well, remember he was like giving that. him the shoulder at the Euro 2016 final. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it was very funny at the time, but Ronaldo, there's a sourness that's come into Ronaldo's vibe that, mm. that is not very um, edifying, is that the word? Maybe it happens to us all as we get older, I, maybe, I don't know. Well, well, you know, well I, you know, I suppose you saw it for me in the production box three years, Jane, so. Of course, yeah, yeah. And I think, you got, I think you've got easier to deal with, John. Okay. You've well, gone the other way of Ronaldo. Well, that's... Uh, that's aged good. gracefully and... That's, and good, that's, that's good to know. Mellowed. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, you're probably right, actually. It's, all, it's the strolls on Kalani Beach. It, it, see, it's the beach. Yeah, it's the... I know he has the beaches in Madeira, but I think Kalani is something... Yeah. There's something about the stones underneath your feet, well, the grounds of a human being. Uh, well, I think that anybody who um, is in Dublin should get out there for a walk. Uh, the hill itself, it's, it's an amazing place. Like, it's a... It's right here, uh, and one thing that sometimes we kind of lack uh, awareness of, and I was one of those people for a long time, is just what is on your doorstep. Yeah. Whether it's Clare, Donegal, uh, Monaghan, um, Kildare, uh, Cork. 
I, I think, yeah, I think if Cristiano Ronaldo's watching this morning, I think he, if there's a spare room in your gaff, John, even for a couple of nights, he could do with maybe flying <laughs> over and staying in Kalini and <laughs> grounding himself again because he's he just lost his way a little bit. Yeah, well, um, I don't know if he'd like to fry up. I, well, probably wouldn't. No. no. I enjoy it too much. Yeah. Uh, right, anything else? Uh, not much. Um, Eddie John's probably going to be sacked today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. I, I kind of hoped that it would... Mm. Burn out in, in the group stages of the World Cup. Uh, Warren Ball is back in Wales. That's good news. And um, Horse Race in Ireland Awards last night, Honeysuckle Horse of the Year. Uh, Kevin Manning won the Irish uh, Hero Award and uh, JB McManus contribution to the Industry Award. And um, it's all though about the World Cup, isn't it? About these two matches. And have you feeling anything in your waters, lads, about predictions or, or what do you feel about England now? Um. I I hope that from an England perspective that they go and try and win the game as opposed to picking five at the back. I think he's probably got to pick five at the back and I think it's wrong. And as a result, I don't think they're going to go through. Right. Mm, yeah, the French have a vibe about them. As Brazil go on, I think everyone is sort of landing into that territory of Brazil being favourites. Right. Um, but we're very reactionary, aren't we? Like After each day's action, we're like, oh, they're the favourites now. Is anybody going to beat Mbappe? So you think Richarlison still has a chance on three? Uh, well, each way, so um, it just depends how far you get in the tournament, I think. Um, I think he needs six. Whoever gets to six will do it. Morata. <clears throat> yeah, like, it's not beyond the man's possibility that Morata's also sitting, sneaking along there on, on his three, yeah. so needs a big game tonight, and they need to go through. Right, John Duggan, All good right, stuff. All right, Shane, mind yourselves. More from John on Off the Ball on Saturday afternoons on News Talk. Now, uh, the Leopardstown Christmas Festival takes place from the 26th to the 29th of December. It's a great day out for sports fans, socialites and thrill seekers alike every day this week. We have two hospitality places for the Leopardstown Pavilion to give away. You get a reserved table, lunch, chat and tips from top tipsters and much more as well. To enter, just comment with a horse... <coughs> to enter, sorry. Just comment with a horse emoji on our main Twitter page, at off the ball, and you're automatically in the hat and remember to ensure that your DMs are open because that's how we'll contact you. The Leopardstown Christmas Festival is December 26th to 29th. Tickets from €35 Euro available at leopardstown.com. Now, back to uh, Gaelic Games, and I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line by uh, Go GA Chairman Paul Bellew. Paul, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. I'm very well. And yourselves? Yeah, welcome back. Um, we, we talked to you about a year ago, I think, at this stage, um, when you'd pulled off the coup of, of getting Henry Shefflin to join. As uh, I, I think your role has changed in the meantime. Am I, did I miss a year, or is that, that was last year, right? Yeah, I was chairperson of the hurling committee in Galway last year. We'd have a hurling and football committee, and then we'd have the county board. And uh, after that, uh, I got a notion to go a bit further afield, Ger. And uh, so, yeah, first year as county chairperson, just put down. What's that experience like moving from being responsible for one of the two sports and then actually having to, you know, undo some of the, the unconscious bias that everybody has when they're looking after their own parish? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair shout. And there's always been a little bit of that in Galway. I think, you know, if you're a hurling background or you're a football background. And to me, it was always always very overemphasized and, and didn't need to be. So it's actually went very well. Um, I've, I've made a strong commitment. I'm a Galway GA person, first and foremost. And uh, everyone was treated equally and fairly. And look, we've, we've a great team with us as well. So I think that kind of the divide is is going away the longer we go on and uh, I said everyone got treated equally be it financially uh, in every every way possible and that, that is borne out but look it's both teams both management teams both boards everybody's working together now and that's that's what's important um, Did it help that you had kind of come through the ranks to see exactly what the difficulties had been and, and had gone through some difficult periods as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. I had two years done as hurling chairperson, a couple of years done for that as delegate. So I haven't been haven't been around the longest, but I probably was there when when things weren't in the best position possible. So I had a fairly good understanding of it, and I think a fairly good understanding of what was required to move on. And I've always been very clear: there has been good work going on in Galway for three or four years. It, it probably just hadn't bubbled to the surface enough, and I think we had been pretty poor communication wise. Didn't help ourselves. That was one of the motivating factors for me anyway to get involved was you know we, we could do a lot better job in helping ourselves and showing what was actually happening and I think in today's world as you know better than everyone else communication is key 
and uh, and I think that that's that's coming out now. And that was part of the motivation for coming on last year was to talk about some of the the funding around the hurlers in particular. You made a commitment that the hurling team in particular at that stage, because that was your your bailiwick, uh, would would not want for any funding. And lo and behold, the figures are absolutely backing up exactly the commitment you made. Both teams um, combined um, ended up costing the county board roughly over two million. But you've been very very clear in where the money was spent and how it was spent and. I think it's really welcome that this level of transparency is available to everybody to see. Absolutely, and, and there's nothing to hide. You know, I, you'll see. I will touch on it again in a couple of minutes. Everything we've produced in the last while has been upfront and open. Even our sponsorship agreement. You know, you hear things at times about being commercially sensitive. Ourselves and Supermax made an agreement. We know what it is. Here's let 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 the people see what it is. Similarly, on the spend, you know, it was always going to be a headline figure or two million. We we knew ourselves when it came in that that's going to grab headlines and grab attention. I made a commitment that Galway would be one of the best resource teams in hurling when that was my side of the house. When I came in, I said football would be the exact same. Uh, traditionally in Galway, the hurling would outspend the football. Uh, that has That's changed for the, for the first year ever. And obviously, reaching the All-Ireland final is a circumstance of that. Um, so we said we'd make no apologies for it. You know, we'll, we'll get the odd kick about it and the runaway train, you'll hear things like that. But the bottom line is, we played 49 inter-county games last year between under 20, under 17 and senior. Um, we won the All-Ireland minor. We got the All-Ireland football final. We were beaten by the eventual All-Ireland champions in every competition in hurling by a combined total of six points. You know, that's that's what it takes. Uh, you know, that that's where it went. We're very transparent about where it went in terms of player expenses, uh, medical gear. A lot of this is GPA mandata- mandated, and rightly so. Um, we were one of the people last year when we went on with Crow Park that there should be at least four sessions a week for our players, uh, and we'll stand over that again this year. And we carried big panels there in both. Um, we're extending out our development panels as well, so that our, our management have enough resource from a playing perspective. So, as I said, we can we know where it went. We're not surprised that it hit that figure, and um, you know it probably won't be a million miles off it again next year if we have the same success. So that's the cost of doing business. But I think the other thing that you spoke about when we, we talked a year ago was the opportunities that um, a county like Galway, but actually loads of counties have in tapping into uh, corporate finance and in tapping into forms of sponsorship in in energizing the supporter base to buy your gear and to be consumers of your products and and partners with you on that road so it's not you don't just view them as like potential revenue sources but like here is stuff that you would like to be involved in how can you help us and every time you help us it's going to help the 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 various teams that you talk about and not just the senior intercounty team so how did you go about raising the revenue because you actually ended up with a surplus despite the fact that the spend is bigger than it ever has been before well that's the thing if if we had a 400k uh, whole and we were spending two two million, we'd have serious problems. So no, we returned a deficit of about four hundred and ten k uh, in line with that. So fundraising um, a surplus, was, a surplus, yeah, a surplus. Sorry, yeah. So that was very strong, you know, in the year, and it could 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 will we expect that to be a lot more next year? Um, and we also have the issue, you know, we are paying back about three hundred and thirty k per year on on an outstanding loan, but that's in the background now. That's boxed away. It'll be gone by twenty twenty seven, and we're happy that that's looked after. We're we're only worried about the future but there's massive commercial confidence and and opportunity in Galway at the moment uh, there's a real uh, sense of people wanting to be interested as you said in the corporate sphere we raised in the region of 350,000 in 11 days um, between the All-Ireland fo- semi-final and the final. So the interest was off the charts, I have to say. And again, look at a lot of this is down to the success of your teams, but also off the field, just letting people know where it goes, uh, what it's for, how it works. We've basically going as cashless as we can from a ticketing perspective, even for the All-Ireland final tickets. So just best practice in a range of, of areas is bringing that confidence forward. Uh, as I say, we had our new deal a couple of weeks ago go where you know there was interest in in the Galway brand and it managed to get us the best possible deal with 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 Pass and, and Supermax who were the incumbent and very determined to hold on to it and again for anyone to invest 2.25 million in you over five years whether you win a match or not uh, is pretty unprecedented if you look into the nature of most of the agreements out there a lot I, of them are heavily performance driven I think this is really important to just um, to tease that out a little bit because there was a period uh, during the, the previous sponsorship where Supermax had issued questions about where's our money going we want some transparency so 
to me, that's like one of those deals like, well, this deal is going to reach the end and then never again. So obviously you've managed to fix that relationship and, and deepen it. And they clearly feel like they're getting the level of transparency and reporting that they need to feel like their money is being well spent. Yeah, and Pat have said that at the launch, you know, and to be fair, again, he's a very strong relationship with Mark Gotcha, our operations and finance manager, and Mike Burke, our treasurer. Um, they were relationship managers. They were they have, they have a very strong relationship with Pat over the last couple of years. And similarly, when I came in, I couldn't say uh, only good things about it. And the past was the past. And I produced a, a vision statement of where things were going. And I think I think they were very happy with that. And, and they've seen it reflected. So, you know, they've endorsed that. A five-year agreement in the current climate is not easily got either. Um, so that, that was kind of a reflection of confidence in, in the teams. Uh, and in the board, as I said, particularly with the with the base level that's going in, no matter what. And you know, we we've a bonus structure in place that I think Pat will be very determined that we reach that as well with success on the field. I'm sure the Pure Stadium naming rights, uh, Paul, which have been mooted for for a while, will be a bit of a boost next year as well. That'll be after Christmas, I assume. Yeah, there's there's talks ongoing in that position. There again, there's interest. Um, if the deal is right for us, we'll do it. I think a naming right position is can be emotive enough. So it just has to be the right fit for us, and uh, and we have options in that regard. The main one for us, Shane, is is the lights in Pier Stadium um, for the league in 2024. That's our real ambition now at the moment. It's it's probably not acceptable in this day and age that a county, the status of Galway in, in hurling and football hasn't the ability to have Saturday night games or, um, you know, even for club at the latter end of the season. So that's very much the next, the major strategic project in Galway at the moment. We've got a good bit of funding put aside for that, but we, we will need a final push uh, to get that over the line as well. Um, you know, that's that's that'll be one of the final pieces to cap off, I think, on the commercial and, and fundraising side. And uh, it's all systems go on that front. You wouldn't stick some heaters in maybe to hit the Pierce Stadium as well? Uh, I, was, I, was, I was in it on Sunday and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you, but it was December. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it was cold. It was cold on Sunday. But look, it's it's Saturday night games. I think give you mix it up a bit. We often hear bits about Pier Stadium been, you know, not the ideal venue. Again, a lot of that can turn into a bit of myth as well. You know, traffic, etc. It wasn't really brilliant traffic plans this year in conjunction with the council and uh, and the guards, and and it worked out pretty well for the inter county games. So, but Saturday night games bring a bring a different element to it. Uh, it'd be great for the city as well and for for the Salt Hill area. So people have plenty of chance to warm up afterwards. Yeah, for sure. Well, head jump. Uh, jump. The other thing that I wanted to ask you about was the cashless stuff. Um, we're seeing very many counties report a surge in uh, gate receipts from club matches. Now, it might be because the club matches are in a better time of the year, and it's going to be very interesting to see over the next couple of years as we trace trends. How important is going cashless, do you think, in, in helping to boost the coffers, not just in, in Galway, but nationally? Yeah, I mean, it, we 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 were about, I think, just over 80% cashless this year. We left a turnstile option for uh, pretty much for OAPs. We had a big discussion about it. We left it. We charged um, we charged more than for, for non-OAPs, for people that were coming up on the day to disincentivize, uh, you know, people paying cash. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So, yeah, it is the way forward. Um, you're also, from a planning perspective, Joe, we're just saying we know how much tickets we've sold in advance from a stewarding point of view, from a data perspective. It, it's excellent. Um, you know, the two million figure was always going to jump out on, on um, spend. But the big story for us internally here in Galway, again, is our club game generated 1.4 million uh, this year. Uh, 1.2 million of that in gates, the rest in streaming and commercial income. Uh, it's off the charts. I, I really hard find it hard to explain um like that is the big story for for a club county scene a club scene to generate 1.4 million and do you have um, any idea paul what that would have been before the pandemic so is there anything that you can kind of our the last comparable figure was just under the million in 2019 right okay yeah. so so a 35 to 40 percent increase it's a significant increase and it's the growth and popularity of our games you know um Look, at, I'm I'm a big fan of the split season. I'm not going to mince my words on it. I I actually think you're going to see a lot of surpluses in the next few weeks, and I think there's a message in there somewhere that club club games it'll never replace the county game. I've never been a 
a fan of this. I've often heard it been said. I know it's heard it on this show a lot as well. You know, oh, the club is a good product and all this. It's not. It's a local product, but that's okay too. And uh, I, I, I am a big advocate for it. I know there's certain areas where we think there's losses, but I think counties are becoming more sustainable and ability to stand on their own feet because of when the games have been played, because of the interest generated in them. Um, so for me, from that perspective, I, I just think no more than the age grade piece, which, which I don't know, do we, we don't even want to touch that. Well, no, I, I, I do, we, yeah. yeah. We, we could be here for an hour. But again, can we not just leave things for a couple of years and see how they go? Because we have this habit in the GA of changing something after one year or two years when we don't fully know what's working or what's not working. And I would say that is the split season perfect? No. Is it better than ever, and we've had before? Absolutely, yes. Before I touch on the edge grade thing, uh, Paul, can I just, uh, it was interesting to see comments from John Costello out of the Dublin GA um, annual report. He was talking about this national coaching and development funding um, and of course there's been changes to qualifying criteria and he was pointing out that it means there's an annual coaching cut into the capital of, of €447,000. Um, does this affect Galway in a similar vein? Do you have any it, sympathy it, for Dublin? Or? It, it, uh, it doubles Galway's funding, but we're not happy with that. You know, there was the John Connell motion last year, which we were much more in favour of, that was membership-based. Galway and Cork had got the rawest deal possible from a coaching funding perspective for years, and we've always been you know, pretty annoyed about that. Uh, the John Connell motion went forward last year, which would have given us in the region of three quarters of a million to 800,000 in funding. Uh, we've ended up with about 550, up from something in the 200s. So obviously that's positive. But again, you always want more. Um, so we want an equitable funding model. Of course, in fairness to John, that, that's a massive hit in terms of what you had. But relatively speaking, uh, sympathy-wise, I've had to look after Galway, Cork have to look after Cork, and we're only coming back to some form of parity now in terms of our membership relative to what we have been receiving. It always struck me that um, the 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 way that this conversation works is pitting counties against each other, as opposed to actually, I always feel like if the counties got together and decided that they were going to tell Croke Park what was going to happen, there might be a better way of doing this. It, it feels a little bit like um, the 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 funding in Dublin was designed to try and get the urban centres uh, GA coaching at a level that was going to allow them to be competitive with other sports and like just as a general kind of we don't fund sporting uh, sport properly in the country and we're starting to get to a point where our funding matches other European countries or New Zealand or Australia but we're not there yet I actually feel like you're right you should get the same as, as, as Dublin but Dublin shouldn't be cut you guys should just be getting more yeah. it turns out that the GA does generate loads of cash because they don't have to pay the players and they're filling massive stadiums. You know, I, there's definitely a way for the money to be generated and spent more equitably. But I, I think there was always a like, oh, the dubs. And I'm not accusing you of that, but certainly we in yeah. the media were always guilty of like, oh, the dubs are getting too much. It's a disaster. It's like, pay everybody else more. It, it, it doesn't all have to be relative to each other, as you rightly say. You know, can you not look after the issues where they are? And uh, and it was very successful, let's, let's be honest. And, and they were... There were risks at the time in the capital. I think the big one for me, and I've raised this at, at coaching development level in, in Crow Park, is what I think is there needs to be an urban strategy. And an urban strategy in Dublin doesn't look too different from an urban strategy in Galway, Belfast, Limerick, Waterford. That's where I have, have my concerns going forward, is that that's where the strategy piece and the money to match should go. Um, we'll always work different parts of Galway, rurally, etc. will always, you know, a certain amount will always look after that. So that's where my piece has come from, is the, the urban strategy needs to be matched across the country. And I, I look, I wouldn't disagree with anything you have to say. I think there's enough to go around and it shouldn't be about taking away to satisfy, you know, possibly some competitive intra-county uh, grudges between people. There, there should be enough to go around. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the urban strategy is, is a great idea. And I, I don't, is, it, is that being adopted? There is no... There is no concrete urban strategy, and I've had it said to me a couple of times, oh, every city is different. Like, mm, not they? really, not really. Most yeah. of them have the same challenges, same issues, same problems. And I think if there's one thing, and I said it was only two weeks ago we had a call with coaching and games, and I did push it again, you know, there should be an urban strategy devised for the for the for the GA because um it's where I think it's where the next big battleground from a participation 
um, issue is. Well, surely somebody like the ESRI could easily come up with, uh, here's the definition of an urban area, these are the ones that, that would qualify, and that's where we'll start with, and we'll roll it out you know, to smaller towns, which also have uh, dense populations, if we need to, as and when. Like you can, yeah. You've got to think 20, 25 years in these types of projects because the impact of the 20, 25 years of investment in Dublin is starting to manifest itself and like let, let's let's try and make it as equitable as possible without costing the the GA communities who have been successful uh, the funding because there's going to be job losses and like I, you know, I'll see the impact of that in, in my local club and be like this doesn't actually make any sense when actually there's a way of funding this so that everybody feels like they're getting the same but sorry we, we went down that tangent let's talk about the underage stuff because you, you did um, speak about this very strongly in your statement um, what, what's your view where, where should we be going with this um, yeah, like as I said, you could do you could do one of your shows that you do on a Saturday. You could spend two hours. I I'd be annoyed at some of what's going on in terms of the emotive narrative out there. You know, we're losing players. Like Jay's always lost players. You know, I played under twenty one, what fifteen, sixteen years ago. We struggled to field. It narrows down. You come up along, you do lose players. But this thing, we're losing them to rugby and soccer, uh, as if it never happened before. This emotive argument about 18, you know, it has to be 18. I just don't think you can have your cake and eat it. Decoupling is one of the most important things that has ever happened in the GA from it. And it's not just about making fixtures' lives easier. It's actually about making clubs and players' lives easier. There is no way in a dual county, Ger, that you can have an 18-year-old playing minor at 18, allowed play adult, and then expect to put a competition in between 18 and adult at under 20 or under 21 level. It is just absolutely not feasible in a county like Galway. And to be honest, I don't think a dual county who promotes the game equally, who spends their money equally, and, and you know, has more people playing games than any other counties, should be punished that, the, that you end the dual player. Because let's be very clear, that's what would happen if you allow 18, if you allow minor to go to 18 and allow them play adult. That is what's going to happen. I mapped it out at convention. It would mean in Galway that an 18-year-old in a dual club or a dual area um, would be playing eight games in 16 days um, over a three-month period, a 12- to 14-week period. What would it mean? It would mean the end of the dual player. What would it also mean? It would in, mean the end of the age grade above 18. Uh, at 20 or 21 that would just disappear and that would create the next problem of where there's no um pathway through so look we're now clarin galway i do understand this and i and i know this might it might bore people to tears we're at 13 15 17 we run 19s at football 20s at hurling and then up into adult we've never had more people playing the games in galway we've never had more participation we've never had more teams coming through to the very end at adult level which is what it's all about and i just think there's been a failure in some departments to run competitions above 17 that are really truly meaningful and i think it's just got a little bit lazy that no it didn't work at the time the 19 competition was a disaster well when was it played uh you know were you strong enough with your clubs or were your clubs strong enough to put priority on those grades we had two very successful competitions this year our under 20 hurlers got a minimum of six games and our under 19 footballers got a minimum of nine and our participation rates were up in the 90 percent in the championships and no some clubs weren't happy i'm not going to come on here and say it was you know perfect it wasn't but it was it was a proper games program all the way through and i'm, I'm just sticking sticking with it and uh if anton comes in that doesn't allow us to do that it would be it would be devastating in Galway so I just think there needs to be a lot more uh, data evidence uh, and uh, facts in this debate rather than the emotive one yeah. like the split season in some ways well I, I was going to say it goes back to your first point about we have this tradition of throwing stuff out before it really gets the opportunity to bet in for fear it might work like there's definitely yeah, exactly do you know um it, it it strikes me that there hasn't been a a lot of leadership on this, like because they made they made these changes on the basis of long form, longitudinal studies that suggested this was the best thing to do. It it got put through, but then now it has no champion. I don't know who. I don't know who to talk to to go, well, why did you do this in the first place? Remind everybody about that. Try and carry the day about the argument. It's like, ah, oh, look, we tried. Sure, what can we do? I would agree with you. I mean, has anybody come out like and said that's the end of the dual player if this goes through? Has anybody said the problems it will create um, that there'll be no pathway after 18? You know, and this again is about the elite player. But look at from a leadership perspective, I, I don't disagree. I think someone has to nail the colours to the mast here and explain 
be very clear of what the repercussions of this, not drift back into a vote of Congress that could have massive repercussions. And I look at, I'm more concerned about the, the club piece on that front because look, at the GA is a participatory sport. I, I love the intercounty. Don't don't get me wrong. I've been involved in it. It's great. But the club stuff is, GA is not a spectator sport. It, it is a participatory sport. And if we don't keep people, players playing and clubs thriving, then that there won't be a whole lot left to watch. So I'm passionate about it on the inter-county age grades. We're actually quite agnostic here in Galway, whether it's 17 or 19 or 18 or 20, because it doesn't matter as much at inter-county because, again, the idea that you're losing an elite player there, again, factually, data-wise, not the case. They might not all make, they can't all make it at adult level. Yeah. You're only allowed to put out 15, but they're all playing club. Everyone that played for Galway minor hurling and football over the last year, they're all still playing club and whatever. Our big thing in Galway is, and there's probably going to be a bit about it in the next while, we're still fuming over our, the way our under-17s in hurling are in no man's land. Well, I, emotion. I, okay, I, I actually, I, I, I wanted to bring that up because um, my, my background is a hurling background. It's clear yours is too. It always struck me that like hurling people are hurling people up until it might cost them a medal or their under underage team a medal. Yeah. Um, it's funny you say that. We're, we're, we're just in going through it at the moment. We're, we're, we're pretty annoyed and again it goes back to a leadership element we put in the request again this year Fergal Healy is involved he's over our minor uh, team he's all genuinely focused on development he was in with the seniors a couple of years ago completely flipped his mindset in terms of what minor should be about uh, in terms of development and uh, we're that's where we're going we would rather play five games and lose in All-Ireland than play two and win one. You know, that's genuinely where we're at. And I mean that. Our minor footballers last year won All-Ireland. Great. Didn't win a Connacht title. Played nine games. And they got so much better throughout. But they deserve the same amount of opportunity to play nine games as did Mayo, as a Galway team does against a Clare or a Tipperary. So we've asked a few times and we've got pushed around. No, no. It's CCC's decision. No, no, it's development CCC. No, sorry, we'd love to let you in, but Leinster won't let you in. Leinster, no, no, it's not us, it's the individual counties. So we've put a motion to Crow Park. Let's see, will it get on the floor? I'd have my my concerns about that. Um, uh, it's just it's just a real frustrating element that this this is going on in this day and age. Another one another one that I really want to tackle, and it, it's good to have the platform to do it. There's been this little thing thrown out whenever there's been a response from national level. Oh, Galway wanted every way. Their club teams. We'll go into Leinster in the morning on club. We'll go into Munster in the morning in club. Put us wherever you want from a club perspective in hurling. We've never ever held this position that we wanted it every every way ourselves, you know. Um we will start at the first round of every competition and only and only rightly so. I think that's the I think you could accept that's that's the way it should be. It doesn't make any sense for the Leinster counties or the Leinster Council to hold the position they hold. It would greatly enhance the quality of competition at all levels to have another county in playing it doesn't make any sense I, I like either they are hurling people or they aren't yeah and I think that's why we want to get it to the floor of Congress to see you know let's let's stop the hiding now and who who is who is it because look again we're spoiled with the people we have involved with Fargal with Joe Canning a few of these guys grades but these guys these guys are training the training ratio they have no matches to play right mm-hmm. that by the time Galway play uh, a Munster or a Leinster team next year in the round robin that's currently uh, envisaged, the other team will have played five games. Now, how anyone thinks that is fair or equitable, and look, we have a very good minor team next year. You know, we may win it, we may not. Uh, again, I would genuinely, every one of those those management team would be in a position where they'd, they'd give it up in the morning. And, you know, we've a, we've a lot to do on our own side of the house, don't get me wrong, I can't put everything on that. We've often talked about the why has the leap never gone through from minor to adult? That's that's what we're fixing at the moment. We had a fantastic launch last night in the Clayton Hotel with Satanta College, um, a partnership for all our underage squads with under the tutelage of Des Ryan. Des, who you probably know from, from Arsenal. So Des is going to take over that side of things in partnership with Satanta for us. But these are the things we have to do now just to just to stay busy when we're not playing games. Paul, what's the what's the single biggest issue or concern facing county boards heading into the twenty twenty three? Oh, that's a that's a good question. I think from our perspective, from I like the volunteer piece to me is one I'd be most worried about. You know, and I, I mean that. I know that might uh, certain companies have financial issues. Just just looking forward, um, the level of professionalism on the field, and obviously we spent two million. I don't want to speak outside both sides of a mouth, but uh, we ran Galway GA, GA this year. You know, four point five million business with five permanent staff. 
and an officer base that claimed 128 euros in expenses. Now, that's extremely unsustainable uh, going forward. Um, I think uh, you, you to have that level of energy and commitment um, is great, but how long can you keep it going? I, I think that to me, I can see it in clubs as well and in county boards, is, is the time and the resource to keep counties uh, up uh, with on the field. I think that's a massive, massive threat. And I, I know people will laugh at me and say, you spent two million, you're making it a lot worse for, for others. But that to me would be across the board, the biggest threat to county boards going forward. It's uh, it's definitely, and it's a threat to all of society that isn't full-time professional in, mm. in all sports. And we hear from everybody. Uh, Paul, it's always really interesting to talk to you. I think we're going to follow up on um, the success or otherwise of that motion to get the underage teams into Leinster because it just doesn't make any sense so um, thanks a million for explaining all that too because I, I do think that it's important that we get to see how how county boards can turn things around really quickly with the, the right people and a clear vision and also the support of uh, you know great management teams yeah. a clear volunteer ethos and then also um, just how, how it should look when it's run properly so um, hopefully we got to, to get, talk through all that great to have you with us Paul thanks a million thanks very much lads cheers that's uh, Paul Bellew there the uh, county board chairman of uh, Galway and um, it's some turnaround really and you kind of you see some counties are really getting their houses in order and things are progressing nicely and it, it's a counterpoint from him about the, the dual player and the under 18 age grade that's another story that is bubbling up yeah. um, <clears throat> but where where's the where's the person where's the idea behind it those people who, who went to bat for this all of a sudden it's like they've disappeared into the ether mm. I'd love to hear his point even about counties not wanting to go into the into other provincial, provincial championship there has to be an accountability in terms of voting as he says maybe Congress will show us which side of the fence people are sitting on um, but that's a mad one why people wouldn't want to play games against a Gal- Galway underage team is it makes beyond me. Yeah, Right, 19 minutes past nine. We're live every morning with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Make sure you tune into the lunchtime wrap today. It's going to bring you all the very latest sports news. It's with thanks to Deliveroo. Check out the app for some great match day meal deals across the World Cup. Deliveroo food. We get it. Uh, OTB Sports Radio today. Johnny Caban, uh, the boxer from Ackle, who was the longest reigning world champion at any weight until Mike Tyson I think uh, Dadcast from 3 a career retrospective is Bernard Brogan at 4 Barry Ryan's uh, book on Irish cycling The Ascent is at 6 and then Joe Malloy is live with the latest episode of A Slight Tangent uh, more from the World Cup and plenty more besides from 7 o'clock tonight follow off the ball on all of our social channels and subscribe to the OTV podcast network for the very best and uh, latest sports content right after the break, former Republic of Ireland international Maeve de Burka joins us to talk about the topic of participation in sport among young females in Ireland. Stay tuned. Oh, oh, oh. You're listening to OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports Rugby. I went over to Scotland about six weeks ago. We went on a whiskey distillery tour and it was just, it was sad and fantastic. And he was a, like a beautiful man, wonderful man. I think the legacy he will leave is not just that he were a rugby player, I think it's the fight he shows. Subscribe to the rugby stream on the OTB Sports app now. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prices include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. The Irish Times ran a story yesterday from Jack Horgan Jones that there had been a survey Uh, undertaken by the Department of Sport at the request of Jack Chambers, the Minister for Sport, into young people's attitudes towards participation. Uh, One of the big things that came up was school uniforms, uh, both for uh, boys and girls, men and women, and uh, but particularly young females found that school uniforms were a barrier to them continuing to do sport at school. And as we know, the drop-off rates for sport in secondary school is catastrophic at a, at a macro level in terms of the impact on health, socialisation, all sorts of reasons. If you believe in sport as any kind of power, 
uh, any force for good, then you realise that uh, kids dropping out of sport is really long-term bad and it's a force multiplier for all sorts of bad things uh, later on in life. Loneliness, depression, activity. You, you actually get better school results if people have um, undertaken any form of... Even walking will improve a child's ability uh, to remember stuff in the next hour. So uh, we, we feel like this is an important story and we should cover it. And I'm delighted to say Maeve de Burka is uh, joining us now, former Republic of Ireland soccer international. Uh, Maeve, you've, you've done some work on this. You've been involved in this, I know, as, as a mentor as well. There's a separate research project that has been undertaken, which basically says largely the same stuff, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, like I said, I, I work with Little and the LGFA in secondary schools trying to decrease that drop off that you were talking about, you know, particularly within teenage girls. I think they're three times more likely than boys to give up sport by the age of 13, which is huge, really. Um, so that's what kind of the focus is on, really. And um, like you said, there's so many other benefits, health, economic, everything, if we can try to encourage um, kids to stay in sport. It, the uniform was the big thing that came up yesterday, kind of the, the headline finding. What could be done to fix that? I think we need to move away from the rigid uh, uniform policy that we have. It's quite unique in Ireland, like you don't see it on the continent or in the US. I think it needs to be become more uh, flexible, you know, just so that um, both men and, and boys, or sorry, boys and girls are comfortable in what they're wearing, you know, because there's also, obviously, you're looking at the participation in sport itself, but also when you look at physical activity, you know, how are kids going to school? Is it easy for them to go to school? Uh, back in the day, many years ago now, I used to cycle to secondary school, but, you know, the first thing I noticed when I got the uniform, the skirt was down to my ankles. So that wasn't going to be uh, very safe or, you know, practical to, to cycle my bike with that. So I actually had to ask my mother to take up the skirt and to my knee so that I could cycle to school, you know, and those things really have to change. But I think we're moving in the right direction. Very slowly. Like really, very. You know, it's it's it. It seems like, you know, uh, I'm sure that um, you can change in schools now much easier than maybe you used to be able to. But at the same time, it's still not something that uh, is talked about at a massive level all the time. Uh, having a, an impact on cycling, on walking, on doing sport in school, it's kind of like these are separate things. You know, oh, we need to we need to think about those parents who uh, don't have to then feel pressurized to buy the clothes that everybody I'm like what okay that's a very strange counter argument to this all these other benefits that are over here yeah well, that's the thing I think the main thing is that the the uniform is comfortable you know um like you said yeah you could say to get rid of the uniform altogether but um it does open up another um topical debate I suppose at the moment given the cost of living crisis that we have you know there's a bill uh, before the doll at the moment, uh, affordable school uniform policy that's um, trying to be introduced. You know, um, Wales, I think, are looking at the same thing in that to see that uh, can um, can families buy uniforms, just generic uniforms, and even iron on the crest rather than having to go and pay the 50 euro to one particular supplier. So I personally, I wouldn't be in favour of getting rid of uniforms completely, but I would be obviously in favour of, of making them um, more comfortable and obviously maybe like introduce some schools have PE uniforms. I know I did go into a school, we had a PE uniform so that, you know, and make them more uh, even designed as well towards uh, females, you know, to, to make them more confident and confident and uh, more comfortable within their own um, the uniform that they are wearing on PE day or whatever day it is. What, what was your experience, generally speaking, Maeve, of, of PE when you were in school? Was it, was it encouraged? Um, it wasn't really. I went to a school where um, first day I was only allowed to do one sport, um, wasn't even allowed to train with the other sport. Uh, thankfully, things have really moved on uh, from then in my own secondary school. But also, even within um, the PE itself, only a select few of us were allowed to do it. Even a leaving cert year, it had to be the the more elite players, I suppose, which really is the players who lead, need it the least, I think, within a school setting because we were already getting enough physical activity outside of school with the many other sports we were doing. So uh, I did talk as well to a friend recently. She's a secondary school teacher and uh, the same thing there everyone in leaving cert isn't isn't allowed to do PE only those who are taking it on as a leaving cert subject so anyone who uh, anyone else who isn't doing it believe in you know isn't partaking in any form 
of physical activity during the school day, um, which is massive, really, given the amount of time that teenagers and children spend in school. I'm glad to hear it's moved on from, from your old school because it certainly hasn't moved on in every school in Ireland to this day, especially in, in all girls' schools. Uh, like, do you, do you almost feel like there's a, there's a disconnect between the obvious benefits of, of exercise and PE and, and studying? Because often the excuse given is, oh, no, they need to study, they don't have time for, for PE, but clearly exercise is in tandem with that. Yeah, I still remember, like I said, the, the, the reason given to me that I, I couldn't uh, even train with the two sports was that it would affect my academics. And, you know, I can't I, I can't agree or disagree more strongly with that statement. You know, I know um, for a fact that um, sport helped me get through my academics. I, I remember even I used to um, kick a ball outside the wall. You know, I actually had neighbours that weren't too, too happy with me at late at night banging a ball against the wall in between my uh, study sessions, you know, just to try and um, release some of that stress, I suppose. And definitely helps me and I think it, it can be encouraged you know throughout particularly like I said those teenage years you know where physical activity um, the the research is there that it does help and like I said even going out for a walk and that can stimulate the mind and um, you know even now we know uh, all the mental health benefits as well that physical activity can bring um, not only to children and teenagers but to adults alike. Do you think people don't know about that? Is that why we're still uh, a little bit in the dark ages when it comes to integrating physical activity into study patterns and into the school day? Yeah, I think it's a cultural thing, really. I think um, it's how we've always done it. So then people are maybe not questioning it then. You know, I I know from my experiences abroad, like even um, I lived in Sweden for a bit and you know, the children there, they they definitely do a lot more pee than we do here. They the, The young kids, they come in they get changed, they shower after PE, you know, we, it's not done here. Um, so I think maybe people are aware of it, but just um, they're afraid to, I suppose, uh, question the, the the way it's done. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure on teachers from an academic side as well, you know, to be getting the results um, in the classroom. But like I said, um, you know, they, maybe they think that studying more will help that. Whereas, um, you know, we know that if you can try get a, a balanced approach, um, you'll definitely be more successful. Your your CV, your traveling CV is 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 strong, and as you say, Sweden, Norway, your time in America as well. So, like, when you've assessed those countries, like, how how do we compare? Are, are we are we struggling noticeably compared to other countries when it comes to PE and and, and encouraging uh, physical education for young people? Yeah, I think so. Like when you think about it, that only um, an average, I think, an hour is given to PE you know, in schools, um, and I know one school I was talking to recently, they have a uh, double class, so they have 80 minutes, but that includes, uh, you know, getting changed before and after and, you know, setting up everything. So it's really, we're really, really limited in the time that we are given um, to PE. And I think, you know, Ireland has one of the highest uh, childhood obesity rates, unfortunately, in Europe, like one in every four going children in Ireland are either overweight or obese and like that's just you know that statistic 25 percent is it's it's scary really to think because you know obviously the rate of them then bringing that obesity into to adulthood is is very high and that that in itself can lead to so many um, health uh, challenges so yeah I think I think the other countries I've I've experienced anyway they're definitely ahead of Ireland um, in terms of the emphasis that they place on physical activities uh, within a school setting. Maeve as a matter of interest why do you think we should stick with uniforms? I think um, I suppose there is a lot of families maybe who are financially challenged and um, maybe even from disadvantaged areas it, it nearly levels the playing field slightly um you know in that the children don't have to be wearing the latest gear or the, you know the pressure isn't there on families to to have to keep providing um for children at least in a at least in that that school setting i know obviously they'd be wearing the clothes outside of school but i think it does take a lot of financial pressure off the families particularly if that affordable school uniform bill comes through the doll as well yeah i just and, I, I was like, you make the point they're, they're wearing other clothes outside of school anyway. And like, it's cheap to buy clothes now in a way that it maybe wasn't like when we were kids, you got like, uh, you know, one pair of jeans and they going to last you for the year. Now, now you can get like good quality, well-made stuff 
in a load of different shops that probably weren't selling it. Fast fashion, obviously, is not great for the planet, but it does mean that it's actually probably cheaper in the long run to buy clothes for families than it would have been up to any point. It feels to me it's a little bit like um, it's a slight red herring when the benefits are that actually you'd be, have people coming into clothes, coming into school who would feel like they can bring a change of clothes with them and it doesn't really matter what they're wearing in class and they're not going to get in trouble for it. Yeah, I, I do understand that, that point as well, I suppose. But then, um, you know, even I suppose every teenager doesn't always want to be dressed in clothes from pennies or duns either. You know, they might want the latest Liverpool or United shirt for 80 euro go as well. And um, I suppose there's that, that side of it too. But I, I yeah, I understand, um, you know, they want to be comfortable in school. But I think if you make the... Um, the PE uniform or the P track suit. If, if you do make that um, something that that the majority of children will be comfortable wearing, then that could kind of, I suppose, resolve that that side of it. Are, are we getting better at this, May? From what you've seen, are we making progress? I think we're making slow progress. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be at the moment. Um, you know, I do think that the, the funding needs to go into it as well as, um, you know, the emphasis needs to be there, but also see if we can try to just increase physical activities in, in other ways, even even um, outside of the school setting too, and try to, you know, prevent these kind of, um, I suppose, the, the dramatic health um, and economic um, disadvantages that we get from being inactive. You know, um, like I said, there was a study released um, last year saying that, you know, physical activity, um, if, if the inactivity, I suppose, causes up to 100,000 cases of disease every year in Ireland. And, you know, that then in turn leads to financial um, implications as well. So I think it's just such a broader um, issue as well, you know, that needs needs to be looked at, even in terms of, I suppose, just as a society, we need to move on because even now you can see the office settings, you know, we're no longer seeing the the suits and the ties and the shirts have been worn every day. So I think, you know, why can't we move on from a uniform in schools perspective as well? Yeah, I think um, definitely broadly in agreement with that. Um, Kevin Cavaz has been in touch to say that the, he was talking about the USA. Uh, they agreed equal pay, which includes World Cup bonuses for the men's and women's teams. So the women's team will get half of the men's bonus. And then when the women win the World Cup, the men will get half of that bonus. And, you know, on, on balance, this is their move towards... Um, equality. We're seeing, he says, that, that Canada are likely to do the same as well, and this will all be ongoing. So, into the future, uh, is this something we should look at in Ireland? Where I mean, you know, obviously the women might be giving up more bonuses in terms of qualification for tournaments, but certainly like equal match fees, and then from that point forward. So, if and when the men qualify for a World Cup and the four hundred forty million prize pot is being divided, that the women should get their cut of that too. Yeah, I mean, in an ideal situation, I think that's that's what um, hopefully will happen. Um, whether it'll happen, you know, in the next couple of years, um, or I'm not sure. But you know, we have made huge progress, like you said, with the equal pay and the the match fees at the moment. Um, it really is is great strides um, in the right direction. The the US, the women's national team over there, have always been the trendsetters, I suppose, and they're the you know, they're the number one in the world and they're they really are they always kind of set the ball in motion for the rest of the world to follow so um, I think it's huge what's been done there and you know to even yeah see the, the men's qualification out into the out of the group stage benefiting the women it's it's massive so hopefully yes um that that should happen hopefully in the years to come in Ireland it would be great to see it it's funny me when you talk about the the women qualifying for the World Cup next year like I almost feel like there will be no choice. Schools will have to allow young girls to push and do more exercise in PE because uh, that argument will be, will be there. The more we see female role models in Irish sport, the more that push is going to just become natural. And I think, I guess, Vera Powell's team have, have really uh, blazed that trail in, in many ways. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when it becomes more mainstream, like I said, and it's it's visible in the media more, then it just becomes part of our culture. I think before this, it was always kind of trying to break down barriers and, you know, even um, teachers within a school setting, they may not have been, you know, even exposed that much um, to women's sport. I know even in my primary school that the sports the, were all led by the male teachers. We only had two male teachers within the whole school, but they, they were always the coaches of our sports teams and, and that. So even now, I think, you know, we will see 
more female teachers, more female coaches, role models and all that. And they will be bringing along um, the girls and, and teenage um, girls with them in that regard, too. So, yeah, I think all the, the I think the qualification for the World Cup, that will only kind of start the ball rolling. It's only the start of it, really. I think it's going to spiral um, to make a, a real big uh, movement towards higher participation levels with uh, teenage girls. Maybe you were in Qatar recently, I believe. I was, yeah, just briefly, um, yeah, a little lay over there. So it was very interesting to see, um, you know, how, how the World Cup was been um, run over there. But yeah, just just a brief stop over there. Did you get out and about? I didn't. Um, unfortunately, the Qatar rules state that you can't leave the airport uh, unless you have a World Cup ticket, which I didn't have. I didn't have um, my my time over there wasn't going to take in a World Cup match, unfortunately, but I did want to, the hope was that I would get out to see the atmosphere, but um, I did get to taste it within the airport setting. So it was definitely interesting to see um, all the different blend of cultures all uh, passing through the airport. All right. So you're welcome, but not really to step outside the airport. <laughs> it's an, yeah. an interesting dynamic. Yeah, I can't understand it from an economic perspective why you don't want to, um, people coming in um you know to potentially spend money within your country but and uh, it's only the rules are only in place during the duration of the world cup uh you know during any other time you're free to leave the airport so um yeah it was a unusual one to be honest one I, I couldn't really understand but um i can't understand you know a lot about that country so no it i think it's a, a fair summation Maeve, great stuff thanks for joining us this morning cheers Thanks a million, guys. Talk to you soon. Maeve de Burke there, uh, former Republic of Ireland International. A reminder, we're brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Before we go, delighted to announce that Jack Queeley is the winner of today's Leopardstown Christmas Festival giveaway. For the rest of you, a reminder to tune into OTBAM every day for your chance to win two hospitality places this week for the Leopardstown Pavilion at the festival, which takes place between December the 26th and the 29th. Now, back tomorrow morning, Keith Wood uh, is going to talk to us about the uh, Eddie Jones scenario. It'll be made official in Borthwick as well. News Talks tech guru Jess Kelly will be here to help you shop for the gamer in your life for this Christmas. Brian Gartland, recently retired in Dock Legend, will talk about his career in football with Shane and myself in the studio and we look back on tonight's games in the World Cup. Right now, Philippe Beauclair alongside Joe last night and what he thinks about Arsene Wenger these days. See you tomorrow. Good evening. Good evening to you. Uh, Kylian Mbappe featured on a BBC <laughs> uh, feature before their opening game against Australia. And he was reflecting uh -huh. on the World Cup four years ago and he was saying, I'm a different player and a different person now. And he, he spoke in very good English and he said this oh, with just a degree of uh, <laughs> sincerity as, as opposed to in a boastful way. He said, four years ago I was good, now though I'm a superstar is his uh, <laughs> quote. And Gary Lineker yeah. quipped afterwards, if only they could give him some confidence what a player he would be. And really yeah. from uh, minute one, he has been extraordinary in this World Cup and he has felt, uh, maybe with Messi to an extent, but he has felt like the sun and this World Cup is orbiting around him from minute one and that has very much continued. Uh, is he playing as well here as you've ever seen him play, club or country? Um, he's playing, no, I, I've seen him play at the same kind of level. Actually, I remember seeing him play at this kind of level, even when he was with Monaco. And uh, he's played a few games for PSG. Uh, I mean, he wasn't that bad at the World Cup in 2018. We shouldn't <laughs> forget that. Sure. Um, and he's had a few decent performances. What I think perhaps is that he's, he's evolved. I think he is um, perhaps making better use of the ball now than he used to. Uh, because obviously when you've got the kind of almost supernatural talent that he's got, technique, the intelligence, perception of space, acceleration, you name it, he's got everything. Uh, a temptation is would be to win the game on your own, you know, as you do uh, in a schoolyard when there was one kid who, who is much better than all the others and dribbles everybody and scores. And sometimes he, he's been guilty of doing that, and including with France, by the way, in, it, in games that took place not that long ago. Here, it's been different. Um, perhaps it's due to the way, in part to the, the way uh, Didier Deschamps has recomposed his team because of Karim Benzema's absence, which is something that must be spoken about, talked about. Uh, maybe it's also due to him simply thinking, maybe how can I go beyond where I am now? 
and listening to the advice of some of his elders. Um, I mean, Moshe Pochettino, you might have heard him, you know, had him at Paris Saint-Germain uh, said very recently that they, he had still a margin for progression and the domain in which he had to make the most progress, according to Poch, was in his special awareness and the decision making. And I think he's doing that already with France. Uh, you will have seen that some situations already and in some tight games where he would normally have chosen the path of individuality, this time he chose a partner. He did the right pass. He didn't try to do too much. We still saw a little bit of showboating here and then, you know, which is to be expected. But I think he's, um, he's matured for that. Yes. And he's lost none of the qualities that made him so special from the very beginning. You know, he was singled out when he was 12 years old as being a future world beater. There's nothing that is that surprising about it. Yes, I'd agree with all that totally. And even his pass for Giroud for the opening goal exemplified yeah. what you're talking about. That speed of thought, the vision, the recognition of the dynamic of the situation whereby he could mm -hmm. have tried to take more out of the ball, but quick touch, quick touch, and goal is created. There is uh, often <laughs> a struggle to say something very new about him. So I'm going to hand over to yes. Matty Cash here. Matty Cash uh, had the uh, misfortune of uh, marking Mbappe yesterday for Poland. And speaking afterwards... He but he got his jersey. Well, indeed, he wasn't even disappointed. He was like, he, he almost came out to the press and said, well, listen, I mean, we all know the reality of the situation here. I gave it a shot. You know what's going on here. So he gave a great description of what it must be like to face Mbappe. He talked about spending the afternoon watching his clips on bed and trying to prepare for it and then the reality being mm. somewhat different. So he perfectly explained the dilemma you face marking Mbappe. He said, you know, France are in possession. I didn't know whether to drop off or to go tight. Anytime I went tight to Mbappe, he just spun in behind straight away. And obviously, if you drop off, then Mbappe has the ball and he stands you up and you're in trouble. And what he said about when Mbappe has possession, and we've seen Mbappe do this throughout the tournament, he said, when he gets the ball, he stops. And so then obviously you have to stop with him. And then he moves. And when he moves, he's the quickest thing I've ever seen. And that is the ultimate dilemma. You, you, you go tight, he's in behind you. You let him have the ball yep. and he does this thing where he stops and because he has the ball and he's in control of the situation, you as a defender have to wait for him to go first and who wants to give Mbappe a head start? I mean, it, it really is a nightmare scenario to the point that the only way to handle him, whether you're Kyle Walker or not, is to uh, call for reinforcements, I would think. Yeah, I would say, I would say so. Um, to be honest, I, you know, that reminds me of Garincha. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about way back in the past, but um, have a look at uh, Garincha's performance against the um, Soviet Union in the World Cup uh, a long, long time ago. And you will see exactly that, a player who is never more dangerous than when he stops. Mm. And then the defenders panic because they know what that's, what's coming to them, but they haven't got a clue of how to stop it. They just don't know how to do that. It's just too quick. Yeah. The, the 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 fleet of you know of of, of feet is absolutely um, extraordinary, um, and he's which is I mean one of the reasons why I'm almost convinced that England is not going to play with a four at the back on Saturday, and that um, Carl Walker can sometimes especially is not a fully fit Carl Walker yet who is coming back. Um, he has these moments too. And he's got great recovery speed, but his recovery speed is not superior to that of Mbappe. And so, therefore, I would imagine that Southgate is going to go for a um, kind of double trick. Yeah. Um, so, having Trippier at right back plus uh, Cal Walker at, uh, on the right of a back three, uh, but that would make a lot of sense. And I would imagine that's one of the ways you try to... Um, to control him. But the problem is that if you control him, there are others to control who are also pretty pretty nifty with the ball at their feet. And um, because, you know, it hasn't been a solo act by Mbappe no. uh, in this World Cup. He's been the outstanding performer in terms of goals scored and the quality of the goals he scored. But Giro has been magnificent. Uh, Dembele has been the best he's ever been with France, I think. And the one who, for me, has been the absolute star has been Antoine Griezmann. Ah, I'm so glad uh, you brought him up. I, I, he was next to ask you about, because Giroud we're, we're more familiar with. 
Um, mm. But um, given the injuries to Kante and Pogba, we were, and we spoke to you on the eve of the tournament, and you had your concerns about yeah. the injury profile yeah, of the much squad. So. Yeah, and so ahead of the Australian game, when I saw the team and I saw Griezmann in that midfield three to the right with Dembele ahead of him, I thought, well, this could be a, an area of vulnerability for France. And uh, well, you can tell me when this happened, but when did Griezmann become hardest working midfield general? <laughs> since uh, at this Kante. World Cup. It's, it's incredible. At, at, at this World Cup. And he's always been an incredibly hardworking um, centre forward or support striker, which is his favourite role normally, which is as a kind of nine and a half or even a ten. Uh, he loves to have the big guy in front of me or the point of reference ahead of him, be it Benzema or, or Giroud. I think he prefers Giroud, to be honest. Um, but to deploy him in that particular role is... Um, I wouldn't say a stroke of genius because it's not exactly rocket science, but it is very imaginative still, mm. and it is quite brave from Deschamps. Mm. It's been he he considered the situation with the team that okay, I'm missing the greatest you know ball recovery footballer on the planet, yeah. Golo Kanté. Yeah, I'm also missing uh, a man in Paul Pogba who is a a wonderful midfielder who can spray the ball sixty yards. And with France, has, has been absolutely magnificent servant. We've spoken about that many times. Yeah. Uh, so you get Chouamani, who is superb, who is very, I mean, it's pure sobriety in the way he uses the ball. He's a great shield. He's smart. He's quick. He's physical, technical. He's got everything. But he needs help. And then you've got Griezmann, who does for the French team what he used to do at Atletico as a support striker, as a striker, which meant that he was pressing so hard for Diego Simeone, getting so many balls back as well. But in the final third, the difference is that he's gone back 30 yards. Yes. And that you have this um, hunger for the ball. This um, also, I mean, and I cannot praise him enough for that. Imagine a guy who is one of the greatest or, you know, greatest goal scorers in the history of the French national team, sacrificing himself at the age of 31 to become a supplementary midfielder and creator. But because of that, that's why he's been playing 71 games on the trot for France, which is absolutely unbelievable. He is, I mean, he's been the reason why France have looked really convincing. Because the fact that M Mbappé is, is a bit of a genius with the ball at, at his feet, the fact that Mbappé is super quick, the fact that Giroud can score loads of goals, yes, we all know that. Yeah, We were not ready for this with Chouamini being assisted by Griezmann, pulling deep, giving Rabiot whatever I think of him, a much freer role, which completely suits his type of football because he's prone to the old mistake. And if you play him in a more withdrawn role and you see Rabiot as a defensive midfielder, at one point or another, you're going to have problems. Not in this World Cup. He's not playing that role. And the way Deschamps has been able to put that together, I think deserves a lot of praise. Even, yes. you know, I'm, I'm not his greatest fan, but I have to say, well done, Didier. You, you've really sorted something out here which required a lot of intelligence and obviously which he is, um, but also imagination and, and courage. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, I you stop short of calling it a stroke of genius, which is probably the right point to, to call a halt to the praise. But uh, we can all analyse why it's working, but to, to dream it up in the first place shows yes. a real footballing insight in his part. So that, I think that, that merits um, praise for sure. And I guess, you know, Giroud is, is, is having his... Um, having his moment and, and it's probably well mm. deserved much underrated all these years in so many quarters so uh, good for him you know he seems like um, a popular player with his teammates actually yes very much so you saw that picture with uh, Mbappé yeah the two uh, you know when he's holding when he's holding Kylian and it's like it's like brotherly love yeah. and uh, yes he, he's really appreciated I think people have a lot of respect for him um, it's one of the Strange ways in which he's in the world is in the World Cup team uh, when he shouldn't have been, and the reason why he's in the World Cup team is because Karim Benzema is unavailable. Uh, he's also playing because Nkunku is uh, got injured, and therefore, to be honest, I don't think that Deschamps has got much of a choice. And also, he's there because he forced Deschamps to reconsider his opinion, which was like, "That's it, Giroud is finished with the French team," and then suddenly. As, as per usual, every time a club decides that Giroud is, uh, can be put in the bin, 
he goes to another one and he proves everybody wrong. And he goes to uh, to Milan and he becomes an Italian champion. He scores 22 goals. And people think, isn't he a bit old for that? And the answer is no. He's got absolutely, absolute belief. You talk about the, the, the belief that Kylian Mbappe has got in himself. Giroud has it too, mm. in a different way. Mm. But he has it. He doesn't express it in the same way. He hasn't got the talent that Mbappe has got. He certainly hasn't got the speed. But he knows how good he is. And so, therefore, you've got very, very, some very strong characters in that team. And which is one thing perhaps we should think about is that perhaps of all the team I've seen in the tournament, uh, it's one which has got those type of players throughout all the lines. Mm. Um, because I see, uh, well, Hugo Loris, of course, you know, you don't get 142 caps and be a world champion for nothing. And he's still very much there. I think you showed it against uh, Poland again. Um, you go the central defense, which we thought would, might be a prime because of all the injuries. You see how Upamecano is growing. And Rafael Varane is such class. I mean, so classy. And then you go through the midfield, think Chouameni, yes, is a boss. Chris Mann is a boss. Uh, you look uh, at, at Giroud, he's a boss. Mbappe is Mbappe. You know, you carry on like that. You think, actually, that's pretty decent. <laughs> Yeah. And it's much stronger than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, because well, I, of all I, the injuries. I, tr- I tried you know? to tell you. I tried to tell you to stop being so miserable at the start of the tournament. And uh, I've been proven no, correct. No, I had my doubts <laughs> like everybody else. Um, I'm happy to be having proved wrong <laughs> so far because we're, let's wait until Saturday. Maybe all of this will crumble. We well, maybe. Know. Maybe. England have the same fears. I mean, it's so beautifully set up in that respect um, mm. just before we go because the clock unfortunately is coming against us uh, the football has really taken centre stage over the past yep. week because it's been so dramatic and I, I, the way the media works is you know working in it at times you can repeat yourself ad nauseum but at a certain point there's there's no new way to talk about uh, human rights and, and the issues off the pitch and it's, it's hard to think of something yep. new to say and occasionally what happens is somebody says something which gives a uh, new fuel to the fire. I had banked on it being Gianni Infantino who might say something uh, but it turned out Arsene Wenger uh, this yep. for so many years wonderfully erudite thoughtful man well uh, I'll just play the clip for people who haven't heard it he was speaking yesterday in Doha now I, I suppose a key point here is that Wenger is now very much on the FIFA payroll. He's FIFA's chief of global football development. And uh, he references yeah. Jürgen in this clip. This is Jürgen uh, Klinsmann, who's also working with FIFA. And uh, they are having, every now and then, press conferences to talk about the technical aspects of the game. And he was asked why some teams had performed at this World Cup and others hadn't. Have a listen. When you go to the World Cup, you know you have not to lose the first game. Other teams who have experience... They have results in the former tournaments like France, like England, they played like Brazil, they played well in the first game. And the teams as well, who were mentally ready, like Jürgen said, had the mindset to focus on competition and not on uh, political demonstrations. I was like, I'm just so surprised. I, 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 don't, I don't know what's happened here. And also, geez, he's picking and choosing his teams, isn't he? I mean, he's ignoring other examples and, and picking uh, some. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, ignoring the example of the most um, outspoken team of them all, uh, Australia, who perhaps will remain the team of the tournament or have achieved more than anybody else. And uh, we, I think we all remember this video that they put out, the, the Socceroos before yeah, the yeah. World Cup, and which was incredibly eloquent and incredibly nuanced, but incredibly strong as well. Um, I can also think of uh, what happened to Belgium, who absolutely, um, totally collapsed um, when they were... They had to uh, take a political position and decided not to do anything about it. We didn't serve them very much, did it? No, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty shocking statement. Uh, but it is, uh, I think, in keeping with the way that he's gone, a, 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 a part of um, our sense personality, um, which is not necessarily the most attractive. He's been a pundit for being in sport for a very long time. Yeah, He's never had a problem with that. Uh, when he joined FIFA, he must have been aware of the fact of what kind of FIFA he was joining and what kind of regime he was joining. He's been traveling the whole across the whole world, all, all continents, with Gianni Infantino, serving as a kind of caution, in a way, for, for Gianni Infantino, kind of leg- giving him legitimacy, yes, because we're talking yes. about a great football brain and a great football person. And he's done all that, and I think he knows perfectly well um, what is going on here. 
uh, he was already a, a loudspeaker for the Biodol World Cup. Do you remember that? Which yes. is one of Gianni Infantino's great projects. And in this particular instance, he, he decided to make this pronouncement without being prompted at all, something that totally came out of the blue for everybody. People were really shocked about it. And I don't think he cares. And that's, um, that's very sad to say that, but I really don't think he cares. Uh, I think for him, football has become something which is so, di- in a way, consumed in its own um, essence that can really genuinely live in a bubble that he can look at it like that. And the only thing which interests him, him, interests him which is crazy for somebody who has such, you know, um, an open mind when it comes to world politics and, and, and history and so on. And when it comes to football, he's got, it's not a blind spot. He decides to become blind. And um, it's something he should be taken to task for. And um, I hope to be able to do that at some point. I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, because to be honest, that he's he's been getting away with it for quite a long time, ever since he he he, he joined FIFA. But there is a larger problem here at stake. Here, I think. I mean, before the tournament, we've been speaking together about this. I think it's totally possible to enjoy uh, the World Cup because the World Cup is the players and the, and the fans. Mm. The players have been great. The fans have been fantastic. Mm. Okay, all the rest is rubbish. Mm. Okay, let's just remind that us of ourselves. It's a it should never have happened there. What happened because of the World Cup is god awful. We should be talking about it and not be afraid to talk about it and talk again about it. But the problem is that when a tournament progresses, people fall victim to this very strange Stockholm syndrome. And it's it's like an excuse the uh, the, uh, the parallel. But I'm sure that people had uh, some lovely holidays in the Black Forest in Germany in 1938. It's totally possible to do that and to be completely unaware of what's going on around you. And if you limit your own experience or your own reading of a situation or a context to your own personal experience and are not, do not broaden your mind to see what is happening beyond that, the fact that there are those migrant workers camps which are just like a few miles down the road in which people live in absolutely appalling conditions, are exploited, have been exploited for years, and we carry on being exploited. If you don't realize that, you can have a great, great World Cup. You know, it's absolutely, absolutely fine. You will think everything is great. Mm. And you hear things such as, oh, there's been no hooliganism at this World Cup because there's no alcohol. There has been no hooliganism at a World Cup for a very, very long time. Got nothing to do with it. Mm. You know, you could carry on like that. But it is, unfortunately, the way it goes. And this is, Joe, why states, authoritarian states, dictatorships go into sport. Because after a while, people get used to that. And they only use their own personal experience their own prism, yeah. which becomes a prison yeah. to see, to talk about what is going on there. So what's happening in Qatar is awful and the World Cup is wonderful. Yes. That's what we have to live with. Yes. Uh, Philippe, thank you so much. Thank you. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with Exfoliate.